Good morning to everyone present here and the audience who have joined us online. Myself, with Aishi T from Electronics Department, will be the MC for today's program. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devu, Maheshwaraha, Guru Sakshat Parabrahma, Tasmai Shri Guravain Maha. Education is our passport to the future for tomorrow and belongs to the people who prepare for it today. A teacher who is selfless, devoted, hardworking, and the wisest person. So I wish you all a happy Teacher's Day for one and all present here. It is. It gives me an immense pleasure to welcome you all for two day, two weeks faculty development program on VLSI design, technology, and architecture for biomedical application. That is from 5th September to 15th September 2022, organized by BIT in association with. Electronics and Communication uh, Engineering Research Center, BIT Bangalore. At the outset, I sincerely thank our management, Rajiv Kaligra Sangha, and its office bearers for their encouragement and their support for the program. The technical co sponsored by IEEE Circuit and the System Society Bangalore chapter. Now we will have our traditional auspicious lamp lightning ceremony as a tribute to Mother Saraswati. I will I welcome all the dignitaries on the dais. It is a mark of our underlying tradition to invoke the Almighty at the beginning of an important event. It is said one song can change a moment, one idea can change the world, one step can change the journey, but a prayer can change the impossible to possible. Let us raise for the prayer by Professor Swati, Assistant Professor from Department of ECE, BIT. Sharanu Siddhi Vinayaka, Sharanu Vidya Pradayaka, Sharanu Siddhi Vinayaka, Sharanu Vidya Pradayaka, Sharanu Parvati Tanaya Murti, Sharanu Mushika Vahana, Sharanu Siddhi Vinayaka. 
ನಿಟಿಲ ನೇತ್ರನೆ ದೇವಿ ಸುತನೆ ನಾಗಭೂಷಣ ಪ್ರಿಯನೇ ನಿಟಿಲ ನೇತ್ರನೆ ದೇವಿ ಸುತನೆ ನಾಗಭೂಷಣ ಪ್ರಿಯನೇ ತಟಿಲ ತಾಂಕಿಟ ಕೋಮಲಾಂಗನೆ ಕರ್ಣ ಕುಂಡಲ ಧಾರನೆ ತಕಿಳ ತಾಂಕಿಟ ಕೋಮಲಾಂಗನೆ ಕರ್ಣ ಕುಂಡಲ ಧಾರನೆ ಶರಣು ಸೇತಿ ವಿನಾಯಕ ಶರಣು ಸೇತಿ ವಿನಾಯಕ ನಾವು ದ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಅಡ್ರೆಸ್ ಬೈ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಹೇಮಂತ್ ಕುಮಾರ್ HOD of EC department now we'll have an traditional auspicious lamp lighting ceremony as a tribute to mother saraswati the goddess of knowledge hello <laughs> ಸದ್ಗಮಯ ತಮಸೋಮ ಜ್ಯೋತಿಗಮಯ ಮೃತ್ಯೋಮ ಸಾಕ a welcome address by dr hemant kumar head of the department electronics and communication engineering bangalore institute of technology over to you sir on teachers day i am full of gratitude for the invaluable contributions in nurturing power of human mind and inculcating indomitable spirits in students tribute to great educationalist and ex president dr s radhakrishnan we the teachers are the backbone of nation they are the cause of change and revolution in and around the world bit in association with ece and i triple e presents to you a two week ftp program on vlsi design technology and architecture for biomedical applications i triple e is the trusted voice for engineering computing technology information around the globe i triple e is the world largest technical professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefit of humanity for over a century i triple e has sponsored various programs to honor achievements in education industry research and services celebrating distinguished colleagues teachers and corporate leaders who have made a lasting impact on humanity technology and professionalism learn about the organization includes its structure leadership and employees i triple e cas which is circuit and system society is the leading organization that promotes the advancement of theory analysis design tool and implementation of circuits and systems the field spans the theoretical foundation application and architecture as well as circuit and system implementation of algorithm for signals and information processing the society brings engineering research scientist and other involved in circuit and system application access to the industry most essential technical information networking opportunities career development tools 
and many other exclusive benefits. It's my pleasure to walk you through the FTP, introduce you to the speakers and delegates that have come from all over the country today to share their knowledge and finance our mental horizon. Today's FDP has about 40 participants participating from more than 30 institutes from all over the country and across the India, making this FTP a truly skilled FTP in spirit. Such FTP was the only way people could enhance their knowledge and share a difference of opinion on a common platform. We have surpassed the various challenges that our education system has faced over the years and has adapted to the changing technological trends in the industry. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the delegates, the staff, researchers, principal, and management for giving us an opportunity to conduct this two day long FDP program at VAT EC. I would like to welcome first and foremost, LM Patnaik, advisor, VAT, to this two day FDP program. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation to be to grace this occasion. And I would like to welcome our backbone of our institute, uh, Dr. M. U. Ashwar, principal VIT, for his constant encouragement and support to conduct this FTP program. I welcome you, sir. And I would like to welcome the other dignitary vice principal, Dr. J. Prakash, for this uh, inaugural ceremony. Yeah. Welcome you, sir. Yeah. And I would like to welcome our Academic Dean, Dr. H. P. Balakrishna, Professor and Head, Department of Civil Engineering for this occasion. Thank you, sir. And last but not least, I would like to thank my fellow colleagues, who is Coach PG Coordinator for the VLSI Design and in charge coordinator for the new VLSI program, which has been instituted in UG level at the Institute for the first time in the country and in the state. I would like to welcome Dr. Vijay Prakash for this inaugural ceremony. Welcome you, sir. And one more colleague, Dr. C.R. Bhaira Reddy, I would like to welcome to this gathering. I would like to welcome, sir. But not at last, not, but at least I would like to welcome all my HODs who have been constantly encouraged to be a part of this FDP inaugural ceremony. Thank you. And I would uh, like to thank the staff and students of this program who are participants and uh, their skills are to be uh, enhanced through this FTP. I would like to welcome you all. I would like to conclude my speech by encouraging the delegates to participate with an increasing number in all the activities and discussion through the digital platform for the next 10 days. I wish everyone a successful, safe, and fruitful FDP program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, the F, uh, faculty development program highlights will be given by Dr. Vijay Prakash, sir. Over to you, sir. Good morning, one and all. Happy Teachers Day. Dr. Principal, Dr. Rashmir Sir, Dr. LMP Sir, Vice Principal, Sir Dr. Prakash, for beloved HOD, Dr. Raymond Kumar, saw the deans of the VATs, HODs from the different department, placement officer, all teaching and non teaching colleagues of EC department, faculty from other department, organizers of the FTP. And all the participants across the nation who are joined remotely and respectful speakers of the faculty development program. And Dr. Vijay Prakash, Professor, Department of PCE, it's my privilege to share the overview of two weeks of faculty development program on PLSA design technology and architecture for medical applications. The purpose of this FDP is to encourage and reward existing faculty for developing their teaching and practical skills in VLSI design and VLSI for medical applications. The FDP contains two themes. The first one is the VLSI technology and how effectively the VLSI architecture can be used for medical applications. Dear participants, in this present era, 
healthcare becoming expensive with rising cost and an aging population. But on the other hand, the government is unable to allocate expense for them. Due to these problems, patients are undergoing trauma and feeling difficulty to avoid medical services and expenses. In this case, wireless communication reduces the cost and patient suffering. This wireless system can be implemented using very large scale integration. So, which is applicable for biomedical applications. Using VLSI methods and VLSI architecture in neurology helps to reduce the size of the circuits and systems, area and improvement over the speed requirements. VLSI will improve the cost effectiveness of medical devices through advanced low power, smaller size, high speed circuitry and systems, which provides increased sophisticated enhanced functionality. So VLSA technology has opened up vast avenue for career growth in design, analysis, design implementation, computer aided design, verification, simulation, and testing. Very large scale integration is a solid career choice and offers job opportunities for ECE freshers, pursuing core employment in India and overseas. So VLSA provides variety of employment roles featuring outstanding professional growth and salary incentives. So one good news is the Indian government planning to invest nearly one crore lakhs. So to enhance the semiconductor industry and planning to start fabrication in it in Mysore. But considering all the above facts, BAT is conducting so two weeks FTP program. So various professions are always an high demand for ever evolving industry. They were very they have a very bright future in the industry. The digital world is made up of a variety of electronic equipments, such as automation, devices, gadgets, and so on. All of which are controlled by a chip or integrated circuit. Some of the following areas of major domains of the VLSA industry, which great potential for the growth. Analog layout design, RTL design, design verification, design for testing, physical design, and so on. Dear delegates, so in these two weeks FTP, some of the major topics what we are going to cover. So the day one start with the recent trends in VLS design will cover 2.5D and 3D stacking systems, followed by the cost, size, and security in chip design. So day two, so we're going to start with AI for medical imaging and practical implementation of AI algorithms for medical imaging and early breast cancer detection algorithms and how to implement this using VLSI architecture perspective point of view. So day three is medical imaging analysis using Python and how effectively we can implement by matrix of VLSI architecture. Day four start with application of microelectronics and how to implement biomedical engineering using VLSI approach. Day five and day six will be covering neuromorphic computing and VLSI implementation of neuromorphing algorithms. So how is neuromorphing algorithms or mimic the brain systems and how to implement by mix of VLSI approach that we are going to cover in day seven. Day eight hands on session implement how to implement the VLSI algorithms by making some simulation to like model scene. Day nine we are going to cover the basic physical VLSI physical design by making this up cadence idea two. The last day of the program, smart sensors and the systems for biomedical applications. Dear colleagues, social delegates, so in each of the session, the application of advanced VLSA circuits and medical imaging is explored. The relationship of both general purpose signal processing and signal processing chips and the custom devices to medical imaging is discussed using examples of fabricated chips. Dear delegates, in these two, Two weeks of FDP is very much essential for present day scenario. I hope all of you make use of this technical event and enjoy the two weeks program. After attending this mega event, the participants will get in depth understanding of research and its implications in decision making process in VLSA design and medical imaging. So, with this, once again, welcome you all for this mega technical event, two week FDP program on real estate technology and medical applications. Thank you, Ananda. Thank you, sir.
Now I request inaugural address by Dr. L. M. Patnaik, sir. Principal uh, Dr. Ashwood, Vice Principal of the Webcast, actually Dr. Hibun Kumar, and I will be. Dr. Vishwan Krishna, Dean Chair, Dr. Vijay Prakash, Bairadi, and uh, one of the main coordinators, Professor Janada, HODs, and faculty members of the department. I hope you are able to hear because every time I speak in VIT, they say there is a mic problem. <laughs> okay. At the outset, let me convey to you all my warmest greetings on the occasion of the Teachers Day. It is very nice and defeating that VIT is organizing this event on this auspicious day to enrich the background of teachers along with teachers. There is no other better tribute you could have done to good teaching and teachers, to encourage the teachers. I would like to congratulate the organizers and the institute for organizing this particular event. The topic is really extremely relevant, and uh, IEEE is involved in that. If you look at IEEE's logo, below IEEE four letters, it is written Technology for Humanity. It is written, it's modern letters. You find that. So what IEEE conveys, your technology, what you develop, should be for the humanity. So there is no bet better application you could think of other than healthcare. In fact, COVID has opened our eyes. It has put a lot of challenges. There are two areas where we had really very stiff challenge and we were caught unawares. We didn't know what to do. One is education, second is healthcare. Okay. Up to COVID time, pre COVID. We were doing online education, distance education, whatever it may be. And in healthcare, there was a concept of telemedicine and all that. But then COVID put the biggest challenge for these two areas that is education and healthcare. And we were all driven homewards. We were confined to the four walls of our home. We were uh, the World outside was spinning. There were excellent meetings, the conferences. Young students were dating. People were drinking. There were seminars. There were lectures. But all sitting inside the rooms. And everything was happening behind the screen. Okay? So it is all thanks to technology. And I think this mode is going to continue for quite some time in future in some form or the other. So this particular FDP is talking about uh, an interesting area that is VLSI design technology and architecture for biomedical animals. It's a very good combination. The day I started interacting with VIT, I said one of the good application study in this uh, campus is medical application because we have our neighbors as a set of experts who are doctors. We should be talking to them and think of a lot of applications for civil engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical, electronics, computer science, for medical profession. Now you know, across the country, every IIT, even including a sort of traditional institution like IISC, they are all going to have medical schools in their campus. Okay? IISC is going to have a hospital, the research facility, I remember Delhi, Gohati, all of them are going to start some medical schools and centers 
they don't have anything, they're going to start from scratch. But we have something next door to us, they are our neighbors. We should be talking to them rather than closing our eyes and ears. We can do a lot of it. BLSI, as was mentioned by my predecessors, my distinguished speakers, is a very important area, as was mentioned, in very large scale integration today, you see the power of a computer like this, which was done on a supercomputer probably a decade ago, or two decades, or three decades ago. Now you find that in this. The chips are extremely powerful. You don't know what you will do with it. All these advances in 5G, 6G, and beyond that 7G, if at all it comes, are thanks to VLSI technology. Because what happens here? You are packing more and more billions and billions of transistors on a single chip, which is probably few centimeters by few centimeters. Okay. So that is what is called integration. We started with a small scale integration, medium scale integration, large scale integration, very large scale integration. Then you talk about ultra large scale integration. Now the resolutions are going further down and down. You talk about sub-micron technology, deep sub-micron technology. And if you look at the problems of deep sub-micron technology, sometimes you use the concepts of electromagnetic waves, how a wave transmits over an RC network. There are a lot of interesting problems like that. Our oh, Dean Sir was talking about the initiative in Mysore, chip fabrication. This country is very late. We don't have a fab facility. PL manufactures some chips, probably they are not of really a great consequence. We had a semiconductor complex in Chandigarh, which got in a fire accident. Later on, space and defense took over. Defense has some interest. So we never realized the importance of this, never set up a package. Now, you can't expect any multinational company to be coming and investing because it is a, a billion dollar investment. They will say, why should we do it? And things phase out very fast. Okay, it is good that uh, the country has realized now we have a fab facility. Yeah. Since we don't have a fab facility for space, defense, atomic energy, everything, we have to go to either Taiwan, Singapore, or Korea, some country in their boundary, we have to get the cheap manufacturing. For a defense application, it is highly insecure because they can put some chips without your knowledge. And detect the signal, they can do some amount of sort of uh, uh, secretive investigation and monitoring that thing, putting some high frequency design chips and circuits that which you will not. They will have additional pins and get the signals and try to do something. That is why now there is a new area which is coming up to design for trust. How do you believe the chip what is manufactured somewhere? So there is another useful thing for which I would like to congratulate VIT. You have started this program on VLSI, okay, which is uh, timely. In fact, suddenly everybody is uh, realizing VLSI is not only very large scale integration, it is very large source of income, VLSI, okay. You will find there are a lot of jobs there, okay, a lot of business, chip making, fabrication, all that stuff. There will be demand of electronics engineers, computer engineers who will be uh, required to run this business, okay? Maybe even physicists, okay? Mechanical engineers, okay? Then uh, uh, high temperature systems, how to maintain. There are a lot of things which will come up in this uh, particular stream. In fact, if you look at the CAD, what the um, Sir was mentioning, CAD is not an electronics activity. It is totally computer science. There are algorithms, maths, theory, coding, and all that. What you see, cadence design tool, which is nothing but maybe millions of lines of code, which is all maths, code, data structures, algorithms, everything. But, but any chip design, put very briefly, you start with a high level specification, what the chip has to do, what the microprocessor has to do, what the ASIC has to do, and from that, we get into what next step called something like a synthesis, okay? You want to synthesize using some AND gates, NAND gates, NOR gates, and things like that, how do you do? From that, 
how do you implement that using transistors? You will get next step, how many transistors and where these will be placed. So this is what is called placement. And if the transistor is placed, transistor has pins, uh, the, the, this has some input, output, how to route them, connect them. So there is a placement, there is a routing. These are all computer science algorithms. Like there is a rectangular box, how can you fit? There is a chip, how can you fit so many smaller elements into that? It is an algorithm problem for computer science. And next comes routing, how do you interconnect? There are things like maze routing, number of things. Because uh, when you route this uh, printer circuit boards or VLSI, there is a problem you cannot route inclined lines. They have to be horizontal or vertical. You cannot do any way you like, you can't do crisscrossing. There are some constraints. So there are packages for that. Next, after doing that, we look at uh, something called uh, its behavior, a bunch prior to that synthesis, whether they meet the time requirement somewhere, it has to have uh, some requirement of timing. Does it meet that thing? After uh, that next step at the final end, you will get into what is called a testing. Okay. You design a chip, does it uh, meet the requirement? Does it work? You have test vectors. Does it give the right type of output at the end? Okay. In fact, uh, the yield will not be 100%. You will reject most of the chips. You will throw them out. Okay. So what test vectors uh, you will talk about? So it has a number of these things. Placement, routing, synthesis. Then uh, because you cannot actually build the chip uh, uh, with billions of them, we do simulation. Simulation is a time computing, time computing process. You do logic simulation. Whether it gives logic one, zero, correctly at right points, you do what is called circuit simulation, the exact values of voltage is correct. So all these things are uh, good interplay between electronics engineers and uh, computer science people. And when you talk about a tool like cadence, I'm happy to know that BIT has that. Most institutions don't have cadence. Cadence is a very expensive thing, okay? It's good for a timing analysis. You can do wonderful things using that chip. And uh, using this, you can do a lot of interesting research. And what we are looking at is biomedical applications. VLSI chip for what? Is it 5G, 6G? Maybe you can think of IoT. Here you are talking about biomedical applications. Involving signal processing and all that stuff, where you can use, add, multiply this type of chips and implement that. So that Anything you do by hardware is going to be faster when it is done in software. That's why people are now these days excited about doing it by hardware. So this combination is good. Not many people look at that. Healthcare, biomedical applications. Only you will have to think about what type of applications we have. Maybe one can have patents, industry, startups, number of things. So I would like to congratulate the organizers who are organizing this and thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk to you. There are a lot of exciting things and applications and so they are talking about 3D manufacturing, 3D chips and all how do you have so that you can pack more and more intense things. And I notice there is a keynote talk from some industry. Okay. They will talk about uh, a lot more things because uh, in terms of fabrication, technology, AC, what we call um, um, SOCs, okay, application specific integrated circuits, the trends. Uh, you need to know a lot more what is happening. And sometimes we can't fabricate the chip, it's a very expensive process. Nobody uh, fabricates one or two chips. You have to pay maybe several thousands of rupees even if you want to send uh, some of the designs outside Korea or uh, Taiwan, no one will manufacture one of them. But there are some educational academic packages, tools where you can participate, even tools also, there are some public domain tools like magic and other things, you can get some hands on. But luckily you have cadence here and uh, you can develop some chips design and uh, these can be tested using what you call FPG. I'm told you have an FPGA lab. So using FPGAs, you can test those things, whether it means the timing requirement and all that thing. That is what we call something like poor man's VLSI. If you don't have any chip, you can at least test these things. So everything you conceive of, any electronic equipment product, 
biomedical, your mobile, the best of the five to six chips communication, it is thanks to VLSI. If VLSI were not that, you could not have got this type of functionality, this type of miniature. It is impossible. Okay. What was in your desktop, as I said, several years ago, now we are holding in your phone. And you don't know what will happen. Even when you are talking about a computer being on your wrist and all, it's all thanks to me. Okay? I hope you will have a wonderful time during these 10 days. Have great fun and uh, take this knowledge and they do impart to the good uh, course program curriculum to your students. Uh, more important thing is about. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to participate in the Thank you, sir, for your information regarding VLSI technology. Now I request Dr. Happy Balakrishna, civil head of the department, civil engineering, VIT, to address the gathering with few words. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Happy Teachers Day. My role as dean academics uh, is uh, to educate uh, faculty members of uh, the, our institute to deliver knowledge to the students as well as share with faculty members. This faculty development program is very apt uh, for the occasion because, uh, you know, uh, industry, health industry is facing a lot of issues in uh, detection and curing uh, diseases. This uh, faculty development program will throw light on uh, detecting the disease and uh, helping the doctors to reduce the time of, uh, you know, uh, identifying the disease and uh, the way to cure. So I wish uh, the faculty members, the participants, uh, very best and uh, learn uh, to the maximum extent and implement uh, all of uh, those things in future. Uh, I thank uh, uh, Dr. Hemant Kumar, Head of the Department of Electronics uh, and Communication Engineering, Dr. Jalja Madam, uh, Professor uh, Vijay Prakash, uh, Bhaira Reddy for giving us an opportunity to share our few thoughts and uh, wish you all the best once again. I wish all the participants uh, all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Jay Prakash, sir, Vice Principal, BIT, to address the gathering. Very important to all of you. Dignitaries on the desk and off the desk. Today, the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering. So they have initiated a very good program. Now that's a faculty development program on the VLSI combined with the biomedical field. Generally, if you think in professional education system, even today, two fields, one is the medicine and the other one is engineering, are the two main professional courses. Of course, many courses are available, but people even today select these two fields only mainly. Now, if you integrate these two fields, engineering and medicine, Today's topic is definitely fit with in that context. So at this juncture, I want to remember in early 90s, uh, Open and Safar has written, he was written a, an algorithm for the two dimensional fast Fourier transform computation. Even today, people are using that only. But it is for few signals only. If you use that particular algorithm to reconstruct image in MRI imaging system, even today, the same algorithm is used and the same method is used for reconstructing images, even for the MM slicing, millimeter slicing, the algorithm is same. But the algorithm has been in the form of hardware using the VLSA technology and the reconstruction of the images has been done on real time, which definitely indicates the relation of engineering and the medicine in terms of 
this biomedical, especially in the oncology field, for uh, the analysis, diagnosis and analysis, and even to give a medicine also, target medicines, definitely engineering plays a very important role. And in the FDP, so the if I had seen that topics including biomedical applications, then VLSI architecture and applications. Even today, the uh, inaugural address is going to be given by the one of the a very good company that's the Intel people, I think, Biswaji. If you recall where Intel started in 1960s, 1962, they have started with four bit processor, and today they are in i7 or i10 processor with 64 bit processor. Just to imagine what is the role of VLSI from four bit to 64 bit processors. Therefore, definitely, this very large scale integration technology plays a very important role not only in engineering not only in semiconductor field, but it also equally plays a very important role in healthcare systems also. Hence, the, con the content of this particular FDP is suitable to the present context. I really thankful to the organizers. They have taken this particular concept and they have arranged an FDP to educate all the faculty members to deliver good things to their colleagues. I wish good luck to the organizers and also I wish good luck to all the delegates. More than uh, 50 people are attending around the country. They will get the hope, they will get the good information from the very good lecture delivered by the industry and the academicians. And they can meantime exchange their ideas with the uh, these academicians and industries. We should good luck to all to arrange this kind of FDP. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. Now the presidential address by Dr. M. U. Ashwat, sir, Principal, Bangalore Institute of Technology. Over to you, sir. Good morning, and uh, I wish uh, on the occasion of Teachers Day uh, all the participants both offline and online attending. And uh, I will not take much time, already it is delayed. I think the keynote speaker must be waiting to address all of you. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we did uh, two major programs. One just before COVID uh, on uh, technology for health and uh, one after uh, the COVID-19. Uh, the same international conference on technology for health. So now as the Professor Patnaik also mentioned, the technology-oriented organizations like IIC and IITs are also uh, starting uh, uh, medical-related uh, uh, programs. And BIT is not uh, lagging behind. BIT is also organizing uh, similar uh, uh, programs at our campus. In fact, uh, the first uh, offline program on technology for health uh, was conducted here in our campus, and more than 500 participants uh, from across uh, engineering and medical uh, organizations participated in that. After that, as a uh, progressive work uh, from BIT, we uh, signed MOUs with uh, uh, two major uh, companies. One is uh, uh, Aventin Inc. USA and uh, B Healthcare. These are the two organizations where we have uh, MOUs uh, to uh, collaboratively work uh, uh, merging uh, technology for medical applications. And today's uh, program is also uh, mainly uh, using uh, PLSI technology and embedded systems and architecture for uh, biomedical applications. Uh, uh, we have uh, two more programs, uh, uh, two more uh, MOUs with uh, Mistral Solutions and uh, uh, Cap Gemini, uh, again working on VLSI and embedded systems. So I think the ecosystem at uh, BIT is all set. Uh, to uh, take it forward, and I'm sure uh, this 10-day uh, faculty development program will also give some relief to uh, work in these areas and uh, using applications of technology uh, for uh, medical uh, use. And uh, I wish uh, the organizers all the best and all the all, all the participants 
I hope you will have a good uh, value added uh, uh, knowledge dissemination in the next 10 days. And uh, uh, thank you once again. And uh, I, I welcome all the participants outside BIT uh, to come to BIT and use all the facilities available at our institute. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now the keynote address uh, will be given by Professor Gahan, Assistant Professor, Bangalore Institute of Technology. Our keynote uh, speaker is Dr. Uh, Biswajit Pak from Intel India. He is a Senior Director Technology and by nomination he is a, a Senior Principal Engineer and the introduction of uh, Dr. Uh, Biswajit Parker, sir, will be given by Gahan A.V. Assistant Professor, BIT. Good morning, one and all present here. The keynote speaker for today's session is Dr. Biswajit Patra. Biswajit Patra has been working in Intel India as a Senior Director of Technology, Senior Principal Engineer by nomination to design low power and high performance and high volume SOC in advanced technology nodes for AIML, heterogeneous and mobile computing. Previously worked as a principal engineer in SOC physical design at Qualcomm, Bangalore, India. He has completed his PhD in computer science and MTech in ECE from Calcutta University. Effective leadership and management from the LI Broad College of Business, Michigan State University. This project has demonstrated his technical leadership in product mission critical functionalities like 3D IC, SOC power supply design, SOC lifetime reliability, PCB package SOC co optimization, low power high performance SOC design, and thermal modeling in multiple time create strategic and business critical products, deploying high performance XPUs, and advanced technologies for nodes for mobile, laptop, X scale computing, and AI supercomputer. He has been author for more than 40 papers in national and international journals and conference in low power SOC design. He is very passionate about mentoring, fostering, influencing, career growth for technical leaders across the globe, enhancing the technical capability of the team, achieve excellence as Innovation Forum Technical Chair, has been driving the team with more than 2,000 plus highly motivated engineers towards generating new ideas, increasing strategic patents, improving product goodness and quality of execution. Vishwajit has been working as a mentor in Intel India's flagship startup program in engage these deep technology startups. I welcome you, sir, for the two-week startup development program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very good morning to all. And I think what a day today is a teacher's day and then we are talking in front of the teachers. Uh, you know, with all of you, we have learned a lot. And, and we all have a highest regard to the teachers so on behalf of Intel and on behalf of myself, uh, you know, thank you for inviting me uh, in this great occasion, particularly on the teacher's day. And thank you all professors, the teaching community uh, on this special day. Wish you all a great day and let's get started. So. Are you able to see my desktop? I'm just sharing the content. Is it is it visible? Uh, Dr. Jolliger? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. So, thanks for the nice uh, introductions. And the topics of the discussion is basically today, the biomedical automation is, is one of the key items. And we have seen during the COVID time that how the technology has transformed ourselves, be in the working from home. Many of us have worked seamlessly, uh, probably for a two years kind of a time duration from home or you know some kind of an off and on. In many COVID, many cases, doctors were consulting the, the patient uh, through online platform giving the medicines and keeping a track of the patients. So this is a great uh, you know, time in terms of the technology explorations, what has happened uh, recently, if you think in that way. And uh, with that, what I'll be starting is saying that how 
can we really change the way we are thinking it today to thinking it tomorrow and making the biomedical industries and the biomedical solutions for more user friendly and people can use the technology for their daily uses. So that's the theme of the discussions and we'll talk about how the VLSI technology in combination with the IoT, the 5G and the edge computing along with the AI and ML, we can achieve that target. That's the kind of a framework uh, I thought to put together. And the idea of this presentation is to ignite the thinking process in the academic community, show that the good amount of research work what you are doing it today, you can do some of this research in this area, which will be benefiting the whole community and, and the students definitely. So that the thinking process, keeping in this mind, I thought to just put this, uh, you know, in front of us and let's brainstorm and ignite the fire within ourselves. That's the intent. So what we'll talk about today, you will see that the opportunity of biomedical technology um, explorations and the VLSI, 3D IC, AIML, 5G, the technology, how can we create an 100x improvement of the current state of affairs over next three to four years horizon? And then the conclusions that the whole uh, framework we'll be talking about. And feel free to ask me a question uh, anytime. So I'll be allowed to do that. And we can do it after these sessions also. Now let's look at the uh, today engineering has actually transformed from the pure engineering, the electronics devices and all which more by and large used to be used for computing or used to be using some industrial automation. And the biomedicals is a, is a great field where we can get the benefit of the technology for our own personal daily life. And let's think about where we want it to go where this industry wants to go over the next three to four years. Ideally, each of us would like to see that we have a doctor 24 by seven at my doorstep, who will be giving me the guidance, giving me the help for it needed. And it suggests a lifestyle change, which can help to give the doctor a prescription. Prescriptions is, is a second phase of it. At least at the first phase, it should produce the 99% accurate reporting and then verified by doctor that yes, this piece of biomedical instruments is actually giving the right information. So the doctors can still play a kind of a check and review role, but a machine like the cartoon what you see is can act as a doctor for you and 24 by seven available at your doorstep, at your mobile app. That's what all of us love to see it. So that our body is being continuously monitored in a safest manner with the data privacy keeping into mind so that my information doesn't go to anybody else. And if you look at it, the, the list of instruments today, it's available to find out any kind of problem in our human body we, we try to do the CT scan, we, we do the mammogram, we do the MRI uh, for the upper part, we, the lower part also, sometimes we use the MRI, we use the X-ray, we use the different portion of the segment to do it. And human body is very complex. If you see it today, human body, we are all living in the life of bacteria. That basically means we have almost 40 trillions uh, kind of a cells and we have a 10x more number of bacteria in our body. That's how we all live. We, we work with bacteria, but the bacteria mass is much more lower. It's almost like a one to three kgs of bacteria as you are all consuming. And there are different school of research because this exact finding out is not that easy. That's why you may see some literature talking about Israel recently has done a research and talking about probably it's not one is to 10 that you know, for every cell, there is a 10x more bacteria. It's probably one is to one they have come across. So let's leave aside that maybe they have done the sample testing in a smaller scale. Maybe sample testing was done in on a healthy environment. In and out, we have one is to 10 bacteria in our body. Now, 
the machine is very important one if we can have a device which can detect and personalize the medicine for you if it can be produce a medicine based on your body structure taking the capabilities of ai and ml in a fastest possible manner how much benefit you get it you just take the drug what is absolutely needed for you so the benefit and then the imaginations where we go is humongous and here why i would like to put this foil here in front of this academic community to ignite the research process so that we can reach there the industry alone cannot do this all research work where the research work need to be done in a combination of both the environment where we can go to the fastest possible manner so that the kind of an essence of this foil what i would like to uh, paint in front of you and and you guys know much more better than me in terms of the uh, the theory and each part of the where we will be connecting that or probably industry can play a role of connecting the dot and you can play the role of doing the research of individual area where a lot of startups one startup recently i know i was mentoring i can't take the name of it but they are struggling to see the same data scientist who is looking at the mri for uh, let's say the brain it's very difficult for him to interpret the same mri what you are taking it for let's say lower abdomen it's a completely different study and it each company cannot really cover all the dot together that's why you're probably seeing that a lot of startups are there which covering the each portions of the body design and trying to find out an algorithms which can detect and tell the disease looking at a particular stuff because it needs engineering it needs an ai ml it needs the doctor interpretations so you need to all of this to be coming together I, before this presentation professor was talking about that in iisc or every iits there will be a medical institute that's the reason where engineering and medical merge together and create a environment which can help the mankind help the mankind doing the reverse engineering of our body so that we can actually don't need a medicine that's the kind of a scheme where we need to think about in our next one decade or so 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 that's the you know thought process i would like to build over to each of our mind so that we can do the research in each of the individual areas and contribute to the ocean it cannot be done by a single person or a single organization or a single institute to solve the whole paradigm by a single company. It's not possible. So let me be very clear over that. Now, you must have noticed out this second phenomenon where basically we are from Intel and we would like to keep the Moore's law alive, which basically means in every one, one and a half year time frame, we would like to increase the packing density of the transistors by 2x or even more. Now, the question is, maybe you have heard about 128 nanometer, then 60, 90, 25. Now it's going mostly 5 nanometer, 4 nanometer, 3 nanometer, all this term. Then what next? That is still is an open question, but good amount of research is happening. If you look at the MITs, the technology review which was published recently they've done a significant good amount of progress in carbon nanotube where a single carbon atom can be working as a transistor so think about this if, if this is when this technology will be commercialized and available the size of the cpu or size of the soc will be further reducing by a order of 100 200 x or even more Maybe the capacity will be constrained not by the transistor size, but because of the heat it produces. Now the carbon uh, has its own another advantage. It produces a lesser amount of heat compared to what it is produced by the regular transistors. So it, it, it needs a wide amount of research work to be done to create an infrastructure, create a you know kind of a VLSI technology where the carbon um, a single carbon atom can be used for synthesis to uh, do the design for testing to design for all the schemes what we are doing for the regular uh, domain today how do we really map that to a uh, you know single carbon atom based structures in future that's the huge amount of research happening in mit uh, stanford and then quite a good of amount of universities how do we really leverage and capitalize in our academic community do the research on this area and and clear path the 
innovations for the future. If you have noticed out recently, the market is humongous and the market what dictates the, the innovations. That's the one way of looking at it. If you see the human mankind of the whole world, even if we spend a, a hundred rupees per month, it creates a billions of dollars for this company to revenue generate the revenue. And if that take care of the health and it reduces your going to the hospital, it's a humongous benefit you will get over there. So the idea here is to how do you really create a technology which can help for the humankind? And that's the thinking process we need and, and, the, and the guidance and help from the academic community to do the research in this area. If you see, this is a very interesting article uh, which is being published um, also in an year, year and a half back, where uh, the Elon, you may have seen the simpanji along with Elon, uh, it's a very famous one, where a simpanji's brain is modulated and inside the brain, there is a chip is being put inside. And through that chip, we are able to instruct the simpanji what to do. Think about the innovations uh, and the scale and the quantity and the health and how it can help these you know, medical, biomedical industries. Many of us, once we get aged or do a different region of the other, our memory sometimes get lost. Sometimes a lot of peoples, maybe in the whole world, there are millions of people whose memories are not working. Now, at this age old problem, or there could be a problem at the even early age, how can you implant an SOC inside the brain and that can act as an instruction giving by a machine and you can give a better comfort of life to the person? What a humongous amount of beauty to the uh, community to be done. So this is in another very interesting research area to work on. And today, I think my focus will be mostly to see how our great academic community can create a research activity in India. And those activity can trigger the innovations in and around. And those dots when we connect, we get a great innovations across. And India will be the number one in that game. That will be the kind of a scheme what I'm going to be talking about today on the teacher's day. Now let's look at an Intel, what we do and, and in terms of the VLSI technology, we continuously innovating to make sure that we have a cutting edge technology, be it the transistor, be the way we integrate the SOC so that it can produce a smallest possible size, the smallest possible power and the highest possible performance. That's our goal to produce and keeping and giving the industry a committed product which can create a customer's delight. This is one of the examples. If you see, uh, we, we launched this product in 2019, we released in CES, uh, you know, in Las Vegas, where the idea was the two, if you look at this picture, this is a real picture, okay, an X-ray X -ray image of this. So you have a package, inside the package you have a two die, if you think about the two die it, in two different process, the below one where you see the mouse, that is basically a 1222, or you can think about like a, a 22 nanometer, um, you know, one die. On top of that, you see there is a 10 nanometer die sitting over there inside a package. And the beauty of this structure is you get a die, a, a, a overall footprint becomes smaller because two die in a two one on top of each other once you stack like our building construction you have a limited land and how do you really you know go you can go only up direction so you put two uh, you know die one top of each other to create that infrastructure now when you create that what's the benefit you get the benefit you get is you get the smallest possible size number one now as we know once your technology is going to be faster and faster the leakage current or in other words when the battery or battery operated devices when there's nothing is happening a lot of current is getting leaked through the uh, through the devices so if you use this a lower technology node low cost lower technology node and only for the compute where you design the cpu you take the high node and put on top of each other you can get the best leakage benefit so in this cases, we got a less than two milliamps kind of a leakage, which we productize this product. And this was all driven majorly uh, from the Intel India. 
that's the great part so innovation is happening in in the india geo definitely it's an mnc company we partner with every stakeholder on on the worldwide nobody in the today's can do an independent work that practically impossible why i'm raising this point is is requesting the academic community to collaborate within yourself and have a great research mind alone you can't solve the world hunger that's basically impossible the complexity of the design is higher and same principle today applied in the industry as well to solve a bigger problem now when you do this kind of a design as an engineer you have a lot of complexities so the, the cartoon or the you know x-ray pictures what i'm showing it over over there if you noticed out when you stack the two die on top of each other you see there is a problem in terms of the power delivery the power need to come from the the, the backside bomb to the package through the tsv to the top die so that through every power supply need to come through this how do you make sure that every transistors here get the required power supply remember a transistors work for a particular voltage and each transistors let's say in a device you have billions of transistors you have to build a power delivery network which is can support each transistor the required voltage if one transistor doesn't get the required voltage the device is dead you can't use this okay so you have to design such a manner that power integrity is 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 power delivery network is extremely designed flawlessly so that device work when you're getting out of the fab you need to make sure that thermal you think about this when this die consume uh, working on a you know CPU operation, it may be taking a lot of power, and then power need to dissipate by heat. When you have a this kind of a complex structure, the heat need to dissipate and go out continuously so that the device doesn't get burn out. So you need to do a thermal analysis. When you create this kind of a technology innovations, you have to think about this device work, the stability and the reliability for a given period of time and you need to do it very fast if you don't do it somebody else will do it remember that and time to market is extremely critical and the low power why i'm trying to put this thinking process to all of us when you design something you need to think about the multiple discipline into an accent you need to design a systems you need a power delivery persons you need a thermal engineer to look at it you you need a reliability engineer to make sure that the transistor the stacking thermal mechanical that really works and you need to make sure that all of this you do in an extremely laser focused timely manner so that you can actually deliver the product ultimately you are doing to deliver something tangible at the hand of the customer and it has to be the low power and all of these are very much applicable for the biomedical and it's more relevant there because if tomorrow we would like to come up with a biomedical devices which goes inside our brain and act as a companion devices to enhance our memory capacity or enhance our memory power it has to be extremely reliable it has to be it should produce the minimum amount of heat possible our brain is about 12 watt is kind of a machine you can think about that way and each of the brain cell work with a 70 millivolt kind of a, a voltage and today if i really want to implant something it has to match naturally with that 70 millivolt kind of a number to get out of something so there is a complexity and the nitty-gritty of each of the item and each of the item is a separate phd topics to begin with and we have to think about in that direction how can we go in this vast area and create an expertise in the multiple disciplinary way come together and solve this problem now this product when we launched you think about this product this pro product was you know a, a complete motherboard was just like a uh, you know five you know 20 five cents you keep one up there you get the board size so it has to be one and think about this kind of a complex processors earlier we used to build a big um, you know desktop and one full table used to tech today the same equivalent functionality or even smarter functionality you are getting in your size of your palm where just keep the five uh, you know coins and you get that size so what a kind of an improvement is being done but does it should we feel good about it yes we should but should we be stay there no we need to continuously innovate 
to make sure the survival of the humanity that's the key questions and at intel we are committed to it and and we we all of us need to be committed to keep the progress going for further maybe in after a couple of years the whole things will be coming in a small tiny or instead of five coin it will be coming a one coin uh, way which can do this whole operation i'm not talking about the one soc it's the whole system you can design like this now the next generation 3d stacking where actually this was just simplistic structures what we tapped out in 2000 uh, you know 19 we commercially launched and the next devices which is your next generation's supercomputer which will be used for uh, a exascale computing and this devices for that we have we have released the ponte vecchio which is in 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 the oven it will be it already released by our um, you know the management raja uh, in, in in last year and if you look at it here but the reason i'm trying to show it over in this soc if you look at it almost 47 um, in a chiplets or a small small die we have embedded together to make a simple soc so when you try to do this 47 chiplets and you attach them you think about the mechanical complexity think about the thermal complexity think about the uh, complexity associated with uh, reliability so all therm uh, I mean, all these angles you have to think together visualize first before you do it but once you imagine you can do it that's the kind of an innovations we need to think through. And when you try to make this kind of a product, you, you need to make sure that we do this. And why and how this help you today in biomedical instruments? It, it's extremely useful. Because think about this, that today, if we would like to do a compute, a genome study, genome studies was not a new technology today it was invented long back 20 years back uh, kind of time frame a lot of research fundamental research has happened but that time it was not so much popular because computation was not available if you would like to do your genome test genome sequence and try to see what kind of disease probably you will get it looking at the structure of the dna or the probability of a particular disease to come or particular kind of medicines is more useful for you and some medicines are not useful for you if you get that piece of data at the beginning of your childhood in the entire lifestyle you can modulate the kind of drugs you have to take it and at a couple of years back the computational cost was too high that it was extremely difficult to do that and today if you see it with this kind of a platforms what is getting built by intel and then industry it's just not the intel it's many companies are trying to build that and, and we we are committed to do that as well where you can get this all analysis done in in maybe in a week kind of time frame earlier it used to take months and years in a, in a computing platform and cost of compute was a couple of million dollars which was not being affordable by the general people so there's a lot of research needs needed where we can use this compute and use for the human benefit maybe a small uh, like a dongle kind of a stuff you attach tomorrow in your laptop and you do a genome study at your home with a kit of maybe 10,000 rupees and how do we really create that kind of a structure which will give you a profiling and a privacy of yourself to do the test and store the data use that data need basis when you go to a doctor to consult him how do you really create that kind of a platform and an ecosystem? Now, the same one, what I just showing one file back, if I look at a little more lenser view of it, you have this kind of a structure, which is your package substrate, you have a two die attached to each other, facing each other and the pop memories and structure. So this is actually a 3D stacking where you try to stack multiple die together it multiple means this is simply a structure. The first product when we launched uh, the commercial product first in the whole industry in 2019, where an active two die attached to each other and, and was you know tapped out uh, successfully and commercially launched. This is a path breaking technology for the whole industry to you know take it further. And now if you see it, uh, it is being adopted by multiple companies, uh, including the competitions to do that. So, so the innovations is not a 
you know, in, in a monopoly of anybody. It is actually a community health for all the entire ecosystem and, and the industry academia all need to, you know, catch hand to each other to, you know, solve this challenges and opportunities. Now, the same cartoons I just draw to show you that when you try to take a bigger scales, not necessarily one die, you can do a multiple bottom die, you can put a multiple top die, they can connect to each other, create a connectivities. So you can imagine what you want to do and develop the technology around it. And if you just wanted to think about a pointed solution from A to B, you will only go to A to B. And if you imagine something bigger, you can do something bigger. I'm just quoting from, you know, Einstein. Is famous quote to be uh, you know used. So the the whole message is there. The technology will evolve over a period of time. How do you leverage and take a benefit out of it to create the biomedical instrumentation is the is the questions and and everybody need to think about it, including the academia and industry. So so now. If I look at these title lens in terms of engineering point of view, it's easier said than done. Each of the SOC, when you tap out, it costs to all the design houses a millions of dollars. And how do you really make sure that before the design, you create a tool flow methodology where you can actually test the structure, the 3D structure, what we have talked about, how before I tap in, before I manufacture, I know that my design is going to work. You have to have a industry developed tool, EDA companies are developing their tool. How the design houses are also have their inbuilt tool wherever there is a gap in the EDA community or the, they don't find a commercial values of investing and developing that tool. Let's say in case of a, um, you know, 3D IC first phase, the industry tools were maturing. They were not sure whether they would invest or not. So at the design house, you have to also have a muscle power and money power to develop those tools what you need on top of the industry tool to validate the whole structure and go about it. So in this case, I was just trying to show that when these two dies we are showing on top of each other, how do you really create and do a simulations to show this, where is the voltage drop or which you call as an IR drop is more. If you see this is the red spot where the IR drop was more at the early phase of the design, I just saw the cartoon to show it all of you saying that you need to be extremely careful, not just by designing, you need to make sure that tool flow methodology for the, uh, the EDA tools are available to make sure that you are able to articulate the physical phenomenon upfront, correlate that in a test chip and develop this device as step out. So that way you can get a predictability. As an engineer, our job is to make sure that we, we create a product which is predictable and working with a high probability. You still can make a mistake. That's a different question. But by design, it should work. That's the intent and the design thinking all of us needed. And, and this is a huge area where the multi-physics engines are needed. It doesn't need can work by one uh, part. You need to make sure that thermal engineers coming into picture, the material science people are coming into picture, the the vibration analysis people are coming into picture, civil engineers coming into and pictures and creating an end-to-end -end solution kind of a thing. So multidisciplinary research is the need of the hour where you can do something tangible, uh, you know, benefit translating to the product kind of thing. And it does happen, by the way, today as well. But it need to be done more and more. So this cartoon again is the same uh, infographics I put together uh, to see the multiple kind of a problems you found out doing a concurrent analysis when the bottom die, let's say you are running some DDI transaction, the top die you are doing some kind of a uh, CPU running at 4.5 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz, how they will interact to each other, how this uh, power delivery, thermals, electromagnetic interference to each other will, will impact the devices that needs the details 3D modeling of analysis by the tool and making sure that the devices is actually working very nice. So in a, in a summary, what you need to make sure that the thermal analysis, reliability, stability, yield modeling, cost benefit and ROI before you're defining a product uh, of 3D or 2.5D, or you can think about the next generations where you can do a multiple uh, chip together kind of a thing you may have seen a lot of devices are coming out from the different company where one uh, chief which was earlier a concept of talking that i will 
take a wafer, cut into slices, and take a small, small uh, chip. Now the whole wafer is becoming a one chip because the complexities of the design is increasing. You need more and more number of compute power to do the things of operation. How can you really leverage and take that and, and do an academic research and industrial research to make that a commercially viable product kind of thing? So if you see the where, where, where we are going next five to 10 years down the line, this is, this is an interesting uh, infographics today we are doing we are here we are trying to do mostly full diet one top of each other kind of a stacking some companies are doing ip over ip core core over core then it will be going a macro over macro it will be going over the kind of a a transistor over a transistor so you want, even an inverter you wanted to design where an nmos and pmos can be part of the two different die and you can connect them so that kind of a slicing is is and and sandwiching it's kind of a you slice a potato in an n number of places you want and you place them in a manner where you can get the best structure out of it and still they will talk to each other and you get into the picture so that's where the industries are, are going and i think over the next five years it's going to be this space and once we go there think about this along with the uh, the research what MIT is doing in terms of carbon nanotube or single particle based transistors we should be able to scaling down the whole size by at least 100x or even more and this is actually a huge opportunity if you look at it right the the market uh, as i was mentioning market is the one thing we drive the innovations the need of the people actually drive that in innovations and many times people don't know what is the need is as an academic community it's your responsibility to create that need and an awareness within the communities uh, to make sure which areas they should invest and and make sure that they get a get a quality return out of it return in the sense return for the mankind i'm not talking about you know, the dollars so this is this cartoon is to show that the ai artificial intelligence we talked about the 3d stack technology so far now as i mentioned 3d technology along with the ai and ml to transform the medical instrumentation world. So AI and ML is the another part where you see the ER and our progress is, is significant and it is going to be even further. So what does it mean to the researchers? So AI and ML can be implemented in a software, can be implemented in a hardware. If you make it in hardware, like any other cases, it become much more faster and efficient. That's why you may be hearing a lot of the companies that are creating the computing environment which is more friendly for the ai based design where some of the operations can be done in the hardware levels and it is much much faster over there that's why you see a lot of accelerator coming into the game and again there is no one fit solutions there there are certain uh, you know applications where it works better for the cpu certain applications work for the gpu certain applications work for a special purpose hardware so you will be seeing a trend where a, a mammoth computing platform in combination of all of this is going to exist in the industry. And maybe we'll find out some other structure a couple of years down the line, which is in combination of that, but that's a far away statement. And those innovations is going to change the paradigm of the biomedical instrumentation devices, starting from the genome sequencing, starting from the uh, individualistic medicines what medicines a person's work how do i do the uh, you know the uh, create an antibiotic saying that for this particular person this particular antibiotic is the best one today we do based on the blood culture best how can we do it the whole body bacteria analysis and can do that kind of a thing We're using the or how can we look at your our uh, you know dna's and find out a pattern within that and saying that this person's most likely this particular bacteria is, uh, is is more there in their body and this particular drug is going to be working more so we need to go beyond what we are trying to do it today to keep the innovations going yeah this is actually another part of it right when you are driving a car there are many times the accident happens there are many cases you see the heart attack happening when people are running on a car and how do you really get the data when you are driving how do you control your nerve when you are driving and you see there's a lot of communications happening when you are coming from your car to the multiple places how do you really create 
a kind of a protocol secure protocol as well as the data monitoring so it can go to the nearest health center and you get all the benefit in terms of accidents you get a benefit over there so so the whole communications in the real time communications plays a significant role and that's why the 5g network if you look at the title of the topics is an another critical piece of information which you need to transform ourselves to that 100x scale or even beyond that so we talked about the uh, technology the vlsi technology we talked about the ai ml and we talked about how we, this 5g network can come and, and and help the whole ecosystem and the another piece of information to yeah, we are all hearing about the cloud the cloud need to be available and accessible to each and every individual to do their compute to make their life better and and easier and we are an intel we are committed to this so if you look at it uh, the compute it's essentially a computing engine, CPU, GPUs, and data analytics, which basically means the data, what is coming to the computing platform, it analyzes the data and, and give you some meaningful insight. So, so cloud is basically, and then delivery is to your Facebook, you are using Twitter, you are using, you know, tons of applications, YouTube and all, which creates the data analytics. And the background of it, there is storage. And the storage demand also is increasing day by day. So if you look at it, I think where the research need to be done, how can I get the data at most secured manner and infer the data in the data analytics? So the, the whole gaming of biomedical instrumentation is going to transform in a manner where it is going to be on time, real time, the data collections, and, and this cartoon is just to, as, as a backbone, you can have it in an age, you may be thinking this cloud can be sitting in somewhere else. C cloud can be a small cloud, which we call as an edge, sitting on your platform, let's say hospital, you're going to Manipal Hospital. Manipal Hospital can have their own cloud, or small cloud sitting at their campus, which will do all the compute and then upload the data, which is needed to the network, the other Manipal network, hospital network. So you can, you can create a kind of a classifications over there which can actually create a lot of, uh, you know, uh, help to these communities. So this actually are talking about how the things can be applicable when you have this kind of a huge computing power and the VLSI technologies to do the battery analysis, which is another kind of a stuff. And, and, and you create a molecule which actually can be helpful to kill a particular kind of a bacteria based on your body's compositions, not based on the average study. Today, the medical treatment happened based on the average study because such a rapid way of creating the drug, such a rapid way of creating molecules was not possible. Now, in future, a lot of research is happening. How do you really create that? Maybe it will come after 10 years, 20 years, but that groundbreaking work need to start now to make that happen. So, the key challenges in biomedical uh, technologies are safety first. Second, is there has to be a lower grades, energy cost, the remote location should be able to uh, available to everybody inside the smallest village, uh, maybe in some national park inside the small remote village. There also people should be able to leverage this. And how do you automate the whole stuff? So the data which is coming in a remote village coming to the city doctors and they can prescribe the drugs and get the same kind of a treatment what a person sitting in the hospital is getting. That's an important automation. So islands of automations are needed. And the value chain gap. Today, a lot of innovation doesn't happen because people don't see the value. So technology must keep in mind that it must produce as a value to the people directly or indirectly. Then the technology will flourish by itself. So that's the another piece of practical uh, information we are trying to talk about. Now, why 5G is beneficial? 5G is talking about the latency. So if you are looking about compared to 4G to 5G, you should get a much more lower latency from 50 millisecond to 1 millisecond. So you will get much more faster connections and you need that. You can't um, you know, afford to wait for the reports to come out. You think about the situations. If this fast it comes, the moment you walk in into an MRI rooms, once your data is come with AI and ML, the analysis is being done. It come to the doctor's room and he get a reports 
ai based reporting and the photograph now he can correlate maybe over a period of time and as you know the beauty of the ai and ml algorithm is that they learn it by himself initially it will make some mistakes but over a period of time the ai and will give you 99.9 percent .9 kind of an accuracy and even doctor accuracy also if you think about today also we go for a second opinion how many times the doctor also makes human mistakes i'm not sure they're great doing the great job but because this is the nature of the job that they will make some mistakes so this can help or rethink their thinking process that yes i'm getting some kind of a um, you know side help which i can leverage too so net net, net i think this is a great technology which is which can help the people and the human being. Now at Intel, we have created a kind of a computing environment which can be used and leveraged based on our uh, core. We have a Xeon core for the high performance computing. We have um, you know the server class computing the Xeon. Then we have a big core, Atom core, and and we have created a platform, the whole ecosystem, where you can do a repeat prototyping and, and use those technology which are using for industrial automations can be used for the biomedical um, you know, monitoring and an instrumentation purpose. So we are committed in Intel to make sure that we contribute to the society to create the biomedical in, uh, industries safer and better in terms of providing the computing platform, in terms of the providing the, the software stack through our open Vino, our, our next generation structures will come at some point of time again. This is no commitment. This is I'm talking about purely from the aspirational goal uh, point of view. So there will be a lot of innovations that are happening inside the company and in the industries, not just in Intel. Across the board, if you look at it, people are coming out and a lot of startups are working on this, leveraging the technology to see how can we get the meaningful information from an MRI report? How can we prevent that mass TB tuberculosis disease when just they go to a and you can't have a TB specialist for every village kind of thing today? This we all know this the skew of the doctor ratio. So how can we really do that one for every village? Do a screening, upload the data, and it automatically will say that which peoples are having the TB and make it eliminate the TB disease from the society completely. So the lot of the research and, and the computing platforms are getting developed in Intel's and and we are helping in the ecosystems to work together kind of a thing so again the next generations where we are trying to create an ai enabled computing platform which we can put it uh, in your premises it's it's a cloud is a costly one and it takes a lot larger throughput time so you can create those infrastructure inside your campus um, or or maybe a couple of campus together partnering or you can be also available in the you know all the 5G operator, uh, you know, Reliance, Geo, and all. So you can get there and, and get this computing help what you need. I mean, our focus is primarily to provide the computing need for the mankind to create a digital, you know, information age where the compute power is seamlessly provided at the lowest possible cost. Now, if you see today, what I was trying to talk about recently, if you look at the Arvo journals where it comes about, there are certain kind of a disease which is extremely difficult to find out that is happening or not. One of this is the eye getting dried over a period of time. Now, the research shows that yes, those kind of Disease also can be detected looking at the patterns of the eyes over a period of time. If you keep doing the scanning, maybe after every every year or kind of a thing, you can find out the systematic patterns and see that whether any kind of a changes is happening in your eye in a structural manner, which may not be visible by today's technology. So, what we really need to do, we are still far away from the innovations. Many times we talk, yeah, we have innovated enough. It's like kind of what else I'm going to do. If you think about the problem, that humongous amount of problem, today's the computing environment, what the industry is producing is what best they can do. It has not reached to a state where we want it to be in a humankind. Today, if you look at it, our human brain itself, 
all of us still remember what breakfast we have taken. All of us remember yesterday what breakfast we have taken. Think about your memory power. You still remember which plate you have, we have it. We, we still remember what ingredient was there in the food. So brain and, and brain does that with a very minimum amount of power. And if you think about this is being, data is being exchanged in terms of 100 billions of neurons. And between 100 billions of neurons, there is a neighbors and there is a connection. 100 trillions of connections and 200 calculations per second. So brain is an extremely efficient machine. It does the computation, whatever is minimum needed. It decides that. Now, such a computing platform and, and it's all doing at 70 millivolt kind of a voltage. Think about this. Today's all commercial applications stop. You see roughly about 350, 400 is the lowest possible voltage. Most of the main computing platform is a one volt, 600 millivolt, 700 millivolt and this kind of thing. So you're far away from where we want it to be. So the whole industry is this technology, the VLSI technology still far away to go to match with the human brain what is trying to do it. Very smart. It is doing exactly what needs to be done. It's not doing more than that, less than that. And it's doing it extremely low capacity and efficient. How do we mimic this structure and create a kind of an environment or a compute which can be far better than our brain does? And, and maybe go to the next generation. So with that, I, I must thank the the team uh, at, at Intel, uh, which, which is Joy, Noel, Usha, uh, you know, our group president, Sambit, uh, Surya, VP, Anil, VP, and Naren, Ulfred, Arpon, Ajay, Rupesh, and the team uh, for helping to preparing this material together. And I think I want my, my all colleagues and a big thank you uh, for your time and giving me the opportunity. And I think we can uh, take some questions if there is any. Thank you very much, sir. If you have participants, any questions, you can uh, interact with uh, Mr. Sajit. Sir, uh, Question inquiry from my side. I want to know about the size slider. You want to know about? Sorry. Circuit slicing. Oh, circuit slicing. Okay, that's interesting one. So when you talk about the circuit slicing, it, what does it mean? That basically means one transistors you, you know, do it in one of the uh, chiplets or a SOC, and other part you fabricate into the uh, another SOC, and you create a kind of a um, you know, structure where they will connect to each other seamlessly. So, if you if you if you see this, uh, you know, cartoon where I'm trying to show through this one, where you can, yeah, this one, where you can do the half of the transistor in the bottom die, the cartoon what you're showing, and half of the transistor you do it at the top die, and between them there will be micro bump, just a metal connector to connect to each other. That way, uh, you, do, you don't need to think how I will connect. Let's say if, if, if the space is very tiny, think about there could be some uh, of these, uh, you know, inside our, you know, this all arteries and smaller arteries or some neuron cases, which is very tiny in nature. It has a certain dimensions uh, where it can only fit. And I cannot fit this into the horizontal directions. But I have a space there to put into vertically on top of each other, which is extremely sensitive in terms of the area constraints. There, you can think about the circuitry to be designed in a safe way you wanted to do by slicing the technology into a multiple chiplet, stacking on top of each other, and still you make it work. That's what is calling about the circuit slicing, where you actually dividing the feature between the two dies uh, seamlessly, and it still works. If you look at this cartoon, what I'm talking about, let's say half of the transistors you're putting it over there, half you are putting over there, and through the micro bomb, which is the connecting between these two die, you actually connect, make the connection between them. That's what is the uh, circuit slicing to think about. Thank you, sir. I think some questions are uh, in the chat window, sir. 
Yeah, maybe you can uh, read for me. Yeah. I can take it up also. How can we adopt VLSI in medical? That's question. Sorry, what is the question? How we can adopt VLSI in biomedical, sir? Okay, it depends on the type of applications. What biomedical you are looking at it? Biomedical is a is a, is a vast uh, you know topics, right? So if you are thinking about implanting a device inside your you know brain to enhance the memory capacity, uh, that's the one of the applications where you take a memory chip and and bunch of uh, you know uh, sensors which connect to your brains and neurons, and you apply that. That can be one way of doing it. This is actually sitting inside the body. Similarly, you can have some instruments uh, can innovate, which you can put uh, inside the you know, body, which will continuously monitor some of the parameters of the body. Those are the monitoring system, or a support system you can think about. There are biomedical instruments, which basically does the uh, testing through the sensor. So you all, you do your, you know, the blood testings and and the end number of testings where you can um, you know get those done using the VLSI a very small impactful a small low cost SOC put inside and use and throw it it improve your safety as well right? today it is not possible because cost coming into picture in many places 30 rupees test you getting it done and if you put it cost may be becoming 100 rupees so people cannot afford it so those questions are coming into picture so you have an end number of, or uh, if you wanted to do the mm, genome sequencing, which also a biomedical machine where you uh, put your sample uh, inside a kind of the way you do the sugar testing, and that instrument will tell you attached to your laptop, you know, get the genome sequencing data. So you have a tons of applications where you can use the VLSI technology and the computational power. So wherever you see there is a need of computational power with a very small feature size, and you can use this. Uh, VLSI technology for those applications. Any other question in the chat box? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, difference between I think uh, GPU, GPU as well as uh, NPU, sir. Okay. GPU sure. versus uh, NPU. Okay, so, so so GPU, all of us know this is actually a you know the general purpose computing. Yeah. So if you can think about this way, right? And and basically, today if you look at the classification, today people are calling about all XPU. They are not calling about the CPU, NPU, GPU. The new nomenclature coming up with XPU. Because what happening, right? Some applications are working, you know, it's a numerical processors or or a numeric processor you take it some of these cases like an npu working in a specific environment better why is it happening because if you remember the earlier ATS architecture where all the you know cores atom core or a big core or the xeon core they were inherently earlier were carry, carrying the instruction set which was used for a regular multiplications divisions subtractions those accumulations kind of a thing now the general purpose computing it uses a little different structure to be more broader view of it and the when you try to do this kind of a lot of neural network kind of a network npu you are trying to do this kind of a lot of you know let's say algorithms which is uh, gnn or rnn those kind of algorithms you have put it into inside the uh, compute itself to fast the process now the same workload you can run in any of the platform by compromising on the speed of it it may take a lot of time or the accuracy so the question here is you can choose the kind of platform based on the workload that you get and a benefit you see that the kind of a computing and today's if you see a lot of people are talking about the xpu which basically means a x is and you can do a kind of an application best uh, processors while well, general application is very nice, you can get it done by the regular processor itself. You don't need anything extra. Sir, so next question, sir. Recent area of research in uh, NOC, network on chip. Yes, yeah, so a lot of people are working on the, um, you know, area how you can reduce the 
conflict resolution fast and better how do you make it power efficient today the noc also take about 30 percent 25 30 percent of power uh, during that um, in, in the while it is a transactional part of it so how do you really you know build the utilities to reduce the power significantly is the one of the way to look at it uh, or think through so it's a kind of a evolving field i would say which is changing and you can work about how do you make it more power efficient how do you do the better conflict resolution and seamless integration because multiple socs if you do it uh, you know knock areas people are working how can you port it very fast so that you can do a faster time to market these are the three areas to look at it any any other questions to yes sir please uh, relate for speech to angiograph uh, ecg eeg uh, with uh, finite 7 mm finfet 7 mm sorry yeah so so if you look at it right there are two part of it right when you try to do the finfet 7 mm what benefit you get you get the benefit in terms of the power and you, you get a benefit in terms of the performance right so the two benefit when you do when you change the technology to technology and this actually is a great um, you know stuff now when you are trying to do this technology migrations you mostly do each better each each of the devices to get a better power and performance and cost also reduces because of the wafer space you get reduced right so when you use the seven benefit you know finfet you get those benefit uh, into the equations and you decide based on the time you want to market and the technology to be ready so that you decide the technology to be coming across right Next question, sir. Any current research going on on uh, integration of computer architecture NOC in biomedical field? Uh, sorry, what is this question? Any? Any current research going on integration uh -huh. of computer architecture network on chip in biomedical field? Yes, I mean, there are a lot of people are doing the research academic community saying that in biomedical workload, certain workload, how the NOC can be much more beneficial. Uh, so that it's question of prioritization or customizations. So people who are generally creating a general purpose computer that may not be doing it, but uh, people who are, uh, you know, doing it for the other purpose, they can use it, right? So general purpose computing wise, they are not focusing on this. But people who are making a custom silicons, they are focusing on it. Next question, sir. Can VLSI architecture be developed for AI or ML algorithm? Yes. If you see today, a lot of companies are doing the accelerator for AI and algorithms uh, to be part of that AI and ML instruction. They are not putting the all algorithms there as such. So when you have a n number of levels of computations, those computations, uh, you know, platforms are bad. If you go and search Mobidius or Havana Lab, those are our, you know, brand product. And and also the NVIDIA also has their own product. So everybody has their kind of a silicon where those uh, instructions are natively embedded inside. Thank you very much, sir. Hey, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor, for inviting and it was a lovely uh, interacting with all of you uh, thank you so much and uh, let me conclude by saying a happy teachers day to you professor and the whole all professors and the teaching community here thank you thank you once again sir now i would uh, request uh, uh, dr Bairar Reddy sir to give vote of thanks Thank you. This is such a prayer that cannot be seen or touched. It must be felt like art. I feel honored and privileged to get an opportunity to propose thanks on this event by two weeks.
biomedical applications. Hmm. On behalf of EC department, DIT, <coughs> the deep records and partly thanks to Dr. J.M. Ashpat, J.M. Ashpat, Principal, DIT, for his support and encouragement. Dr. J. Prakash, Vice Principal, DIT, for his regular supporters, and Dr. Uh, Professor L. M. Portnoy, Adjacent Professor and Advisor for Technical and R&D Center, DIT. Thank you. I am also thankful to the keynote speaker, Iswajit sir, for his gracious time and presence to give great advice on VLSI. Thank you, sir. Today, my words are not enough to express the gratitude to Raja Vakira Sangha and Bangalore Institute of Technology. Thank you. I would like to thank you, our HOD, Dr. Raymond Kumar and Dr. Vijay Prakash, PG coordinator, their guidance and support to conduct the CEO. Thank you, sir. I am very much thankful to all our teaching and non-teaching staff and HODs of all department, BIT, and, and participants in this event. Okay. And also I am very thank, very much thankful to the sponsor sponsoring agencies for their support, like IEEE, Sudan Chapter, and CAS team. Thank you, Asim. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir, Omni, ma'am. Thank you very much, sir. Now I would uh, request uh, uh, Professor Gahan to um, read the next speaker biodata. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, engineer and my engineering manager, ASIC Design in Media. Uh, Sri Satyan Banerjee has over 20 years of experience in VLSI front end design for systems uh, spanning communications, multimedia, networking, accelerators, and SOC. He is an engineering manager at NVIDIA Graphics, Bangalore, leading a team of designers and architects working on input output interconnect protocols. He holds a bachelor's degree with gold medal in electrical and electronics engineering from the PSG College of Technology. University Coimbatore. He has taken several leadership roles in the ITP student branch. He has chaired the ITP Gold Affinity Group Bangalore won the best Gold Affinity Group Award for Art and in 2004. He is an amateur radio enthusiast and likes to read history and economics besides science and technology. Sir, dear yes, sir, we warmly welcome you for Tariq's faculty development program. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Am I audible? Uh, is it oh, fine? Hello. Uh, hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me to this uh, event. It's my honor to uh, be part of this event, especially on this special day. Uh, uh, happy Teachers Day to one and all present here. I'm what I am today because of my teachers. So, thanks. Thanks for this opportunity, Dr. Jaita. So uh, my talk is going to be about uh, recent trends in uh, VLSI design. So this will be slightly different from uh, what Dr. Patra spoke a little while ago. So VLSI technology deals with uh, the hardware part, the, uh, the fabrication part, and the design uh, deals with what we do in the front end design and uh, what kind of architectures that we use and uh, uh, various other parameters that we try to optimize uh, in the process. So uh, again, like power optimization does happen at the fabrication side also, but uh, this is something that uh, there are other parameters that we uh, design considerations that we make uh, uh, at the time of uh, design. So I'm going to discuss some of uh, those. So at the outset, when uh, Dr. Jalaja spoke to me about uh, this conference, like uh, uh, it was like uh, just trying to think through, like sometimes we uh, uh, miss out like what the work we are doing uh, about this thing. 
So I was trying to think through like, what are the VLSI applications uh, uh, that we have for biomedical? Uh, what, what are the uh, applications, biomedical applications of uh, VLSI design? So uh, on careful in introspection, I see that uh, today the battle is being uh, fought at the compute front. Like uh, we are, uh, uh, the, the, there, there is one aspect of biomedical application, which is the transducers, sensors, and actuators. Uh, that, that uh, setting that aside, like uh, there is an other, another aspect, which is the compute, where, uh, uh, like as uh, Dr. Patra pointed out, uh, genome sequencing or uh, analyzing, uh, 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 like say we get uh, CT scan reports, like uh, uh, reinforcing what the doctor uh, infers from a CT scan report. So these are some of the things that uh, are being enabled by uh, AI and ML, and uh, NVIDIA is at the forefront of uh, AI. So. Let me just uh, start with, and also uh, th there are multiple other computational uh, 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 tasks which are ge getting uh, accelerated through NVIDIA's uh, GPU. So let me give a quick uh, overview of those. Let me start with this uh, video. Uh, please let me know if uh, the video plays fine. I, I can repeat it or uh, uh, we can just work it out. The okay. Uh, yeah. Let me just let it uh, before again. Yeah. Visible, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's it's not visible. The video is visible. Um. What Only about audio is. No, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah, so audio is uh... okay. Uh, what about uh, my uh, slides? Are they visible now? You only your face is visible, sir. I am sharing this uh, slides actually. Just a moment. Share, share your slides, sir. Yeah, uh, is the slide visible now? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, probably let me just replay that. Uh, let me know if there is any problem. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. Like, I think uh, technology has its own <laughs> disadvantages. Yes, sir. Is it visible now? Yes, sir. Okay. Visible. But uh, audio is the problem once again. that that's okay uh, let, let me just uh... share your screen sir yeah i'm sharing my screen actually start sharing. oh okay Wait, just a moment just a moment i think i got the problem Okay, so what I wanted to highlight with this uh, uh, video was that, uh, uh, at like as you might have seen with the uh, our uh, agenda also, the entire first week is kind of dominated by topics from uh, AI and uh, ML. So uh, uh, like AI and ML in healthcare is also like uh, one of the critical uh, aspects, and that is becoming like uh, 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 one of the hottest topics of uh, research as well. And uh, Nvidia has a suite of uh, 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 tools called uh, which is bundled as a uh, tool toolkit called uh, Clara, and uh, that that actually gives a lot of uh, uh, innovative solutions like uh, opportunity to innovate uh, through that uh, toolkit. So let me uh, uh, play the try to play the video later, but I'll uh, talk over like what is the hardware challenges like uh, that is involved in uh, creating such uh, uh, AI uh, applications. So uh, what you see on the right hand side is uh, the NVIDIA Hopper. Uh, we call it the GH100, Hopper 100 uh, chip. So uh, this is just being uh, released to customers uh, right now. Uh, this chip, uh, uh, to put things in perspective, this has about 80 billion transistors. So if you uh, want to uh, 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 put, thing, put this in perspective, like, uh, it's roughly about 10 transistors for every person on this earth. And this chip can uh, ca uh, ca compute about uh, 4,000 T flops, which is roughly about like 400 times more powerful than the most powerful desktop or a laptop uh, PC that is available today. That it, just that's the capability of this one chip or one uh, uh, board which I'm talking about. So these are the uh, VLSI devices, or v these are the VLSI. Uh, 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 these are the chips that are driving uh, uh, the forefront of AI and ML today. And uh, coming to the one on the right hand side, like uh, this is a super chip, the Grace Hopper super chip, where uh, we have a GPU. This is the same as what we see in the left hand side, where is the Hopper uh, uh, CPU, GPU, and a Grace uh, CPU, both uh, stacked on a single uh, uh, board. And uh, this super chip goes into uh, servers, and multiple of this uh, super chip builds a supercomputer. And this expedites a lot of these computations that we uh, do in AI and ML today. Uh, to put like uh, a genome, take the case of genome sequencing from days or even hours, uh, from years of uh, effort, it has boiled down to few minutes. And as uh, Dr. Patra pointed out, democratizing uh, tools like uh, genome sequencing uh, is like uh, being enabled by AI and ML. When we're building these complex chips, like there are multiple things under consideration. Some of the technology aspects, the VLSI technology aspects, I think uh, 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 Dr. Patra already covered. And I'm going to cover the design aspects uh, here. 
So let us see what are the design aspects, the major design aspects. There are multiple other things. I'm just considering the top four uh, design aspects that we uh, typically consider. So they are the size, the cost, safety and security. So let us go over it uh, one by one. So size challenges. So you all uh, might have uh, read in books that uh, there used to be a law similar to the Moore's law called Denard scaling. Like uh, Denard scaling uh, is nothing but it's not a law per se, but then uh, what it says is the CMOS transistor scale uh, in size and co with constant power density. The constant power density is the most uh, important factor here. So what it says is like uh, whenever we scale the transistors, we also need to reduce and increase the number of transistors in a chip. We also need to reduce the uh, voltage, uh, uh, the power and thereby the voltage that uh, can power the transistors. So why the Denard scaling has slowed down? That's obvious, like uh, because of physics, like we have this uh, reverse bias voltage and nothing can, uh, like we have very little options to fully eliminate that. So what happened with the uh, going away of Denard scaling was, there is an important metric that we use to build these uh, chips and thereby the systems that is called the perf or the performance per watt. So the performance per watt used to scale uh, with the Denard scaling and now with the Denard scaling gone, it requires architectural changes. When I say architectural changes, like we are used to having a CPU like uh, or we are used to having a server which has an x86 uh, processor, but albeit just a processor, nothing more than that. But now the processor alone is not going to suffice. And that's exactly what Dr. Patra also referred in his previous talk, that we are going into a domain of XPUs or uh, something like a GPU, which is a graphics processing unit, uh, a DPU, which is a data processing unit. So all these are hardware accelerators. So the size challenges like post uh, uh, make us to look for alternative architectural uh, solutions. And that takes us to hardware accelerators. So a picture I've shown here on the right is the picture of a DPU. So a DPU may uh, hitherto be unknown uh, uh, like uh, to most of the people, but it is nothing but a data processing unit. It's more like a, a, a marketing jargon, I would say. But what it actually does is uh, this sits in the network interface card, like uh, the picture which is blurred in the background is that it's in a network interface card. A part of this DPU is a network interface card on top of it, it has got acceleration engines, uh, uh, programmable ARM cores for doing some computation and a PCI uh, for interconnectivity. So, uh, so uh, like what do these acceleration engines do? Like there are multiple network operations that are being carried forward. Like, uh, of course, when we say a system, a system is not just processing. The system is also interconnect. Like a, a processor, when it computes data, it has to uh, take the data, the data has to be taken and stored into a, a storage uh, a storage or a storage network and it has to, uh, and sometimes like uh, uh, these days like the data centers are become uh, becoming so complex that the processors need to talk among themselves so that is where the network comes into picture and accelerating uh, some of the network functions like encryption or uh, uh, like a uh, uh, table uh, lookup so these are some of the things that uh, the dpu does more efficiently and what it does is it takes out the load out of the core processor or the x86 processor so, uh, by the way, I just want to do a quick check, like, uh, uh, are the slides visible and you don't have any problem at this point? Uh, uh, is it, are we good to go? Uh, hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, at any point in time, I'm uh, also looking at the chat window on another monitor. So uh, any point in time, feel free to uh, drop a question. So uh, I, I uh, yeah, uh, we can have an interactive session. So uh, these are the size challenges that we talked about. So now uh, what is happening? Like uh, what are the solutions? Like the solutions are like, we try to reduce the power of the design. So we have a bunch of techniques, like cert certain techniques we may not uh, explore previously because uh, uh, so when something comes for free, when you don't have to uh, put in that extra effort, like uh, people typically t don't tend to uh, burn that because it comes with uh, uh, more cost. But then now that we are uh, gated by all these uh, technology uh, limitations, like uh, we are going to uh, reduce the power, like make it uh, lower power so that we can compact more uh, transistors. As I told you, the power density is a more critical thing. So reducing the power like uh, makes it more uh, uh, compact. But uh, not all applications, we can have uh, low power. Like uh, not all applications can be low power. Like uh, there are some applications, especially in biomedical, 
where uh, power cannot be reduced beyond the threshold uh, at the cost of reliability. The next comes parallel design. So we might have all, all heard about uh, multi-core processors like uh, 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 like the typical uh, i5, i7, i9. So all these numbers stand for like uh, how many cores are going to be there in the processor. But what is the limitation there? Like uh, the multi-core processor, but, but just by throwing in more number of cores, can we achieve what we can, what we'll be able to achieve? The restriction comes there in the form of what is called the Amdahl's law. When we say that we can put in multiple cores, like what happens is like uh, uh, we need to also segment our task. For example, we are doing a matrix multiplication. Say four, four say a four by four matrix multiplication, there will be finite number of multiply and accumulate operations. So when we say a multiply operation, the multiply operations can all be done parallelly. So we can probably, I'm just giving an example, but uh, this is some, something which is not done uh, in a normal uh, 16 core processor. I'm just taking an example so, uh, so that we can all uh, be on the same page. So uh, like we can do a multiply parallelly, but then for adding like, again, it becomes a bottleneck. So that is what the Amdahl's law says. Like Amdahl's law says that when we parallelize the design by adding multiple cores, like the, the uh, process which takes the maximum time becomes uh, the gating factor and that determines the overall efficiency of the parallelism. Beyond this, we have other techniques like uh, efficient memory and paging and caching. So when I say paging and caching, uh, it's a topic on its own. Like uh, this relates more to computer architecture. The more number of times we access the uh, DDR memory or the HBM, uh, these days we have uh, 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 what is called the HBM memory, which can be uh, which can be stacked onto the chip. So the more accesses that we make to these uh, memories, like uh, uh, the more the latency is going to incur and lesser number of uh, computations are going to uh, be provided per second. So how to improve the paging and caching techniques, and then the locality, the spatial and the temporal locality. So when we fetch the data. Can, I, can we fetch a little bit more data from the same page in the DDR? Like a DDR memory is organized in terms of pages. So uh, what uh, if, if I fetch the data from the DDR, like for a particular design, am I making the best use of the uh, uh, data that I'm fetching? Or when, when we read a page from the DDR, are we making the best use of it? Can we store the data in such a way in the uh, DDR such that the, uh, uh, the reads and writes can be optimized? So all these uh, four topics which I've listed down, they are all uh, active topics of research as well. There are multiple uh, uh, research uh, going on in these fields, especially like uh, uh, topics like parallelism, where multi-core uh, getting the best efficiency of the parallel uh, designs, and also the uh, efficient memory paging and uh, caching techniques. So the solution uh, come, boils down to hardware acceleration, as I pointed out. Like uh, we have accelerators like uh, GPU, FPGAs, and uh, network accelerators like uh, DPUs. So I just put a chart here, like uh, to give a perspective of where things stand with respect to acceleration. So uh, from the 80s, like if you see, like uh, until uh, hardware acceleration uh, started as a, uh, like uh, hardware acceleration started becoming a commonplace thing, like uh, we had a single thread uh, performance, which is which was slowly ramping, and then the multi-thread performance was slightly uh, above that, which was like uh, increasing at a rate, pace of like 1.5x to 1.1x uh, per year. But then somewhere in the uh, 2000s, accelerated computing uh, started gaining more traction. That is, for example, using uh, uh, GPUs. Uh, 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 accelerated computing, so, so to speak, I can uh, say that it started with NVIDIA GPU because of the availability of the CUDA uh, uh, programming language. And then this is the kind of uh, acceleration that the accelerated computing has provided in the last 10 plus years. Whereas the uh, whereas the single thread performance of the uh, traditional CPUs is kind of plateauing, the accelerated computing is still uh, uh, look, uh, uh, waiting to reach the, that kind of a plateau. Beyond the accelerated computing, we also have what is known as a scale up and scale out. Like when I the, the chip that I showed uh, in the first slide, that is the Hopper 100 chip, that is just a single chip. Like now, what if we can create a cluster of those chips and use it in our application? So these are the clusters and uh, at NVIDIA, we uh, make these clusters and we call it the DGX, uh, the DGX. And now we are in the second generation DGX2. Uh, we'll soon be in the third generation uh, DGX3. So these are the scale out applications where we can multiple of these clusters can be connected and we can create almost a supercomputer. And uh, uh, these come and uh, these can be like hosted in the uh, uh, cloud and uh, uh, renting them comes at a, a fraction of a cost. And then 
comes what is known as a machine learning. So when I say uh, today, uh, NVIDIA is using something, uh, an interesting uh, technique. So uh, if you have to, if you have uh, uh, been a, uh, using, I mean, if you have a, a gamer, you might know that uh, number of frames per second, like uh, the number of frames that are displayed per second is the most critical parameter. And displaying more number of frames per second uh, involves more computation. But can we relate, the, the video is not going to uh, have too many changes. There, there is a contextual information from the previous frame that is already present in the next frame. I'm, I'm sure like if you have uh, gone through the video uh, encoders and decoding standards or, or the video uh, coding standards, like they make use of the same uh, 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 technique. So we have a machine learning algorithm which learns what or how the frames change or what kind of uh, background that the game is using and uh, what kind of motion is uh, being used in the game. It learns that and then it op operates and provides us a uh, greater FPS without the actual uh, video buffers having to uh, uh, process the data at that uh, speed. So that is where the machine learning is going to further provide uh, uh, like um, uh, multi thousand, uh, multi million time uh, uh, speed up in our uh, computation power. We are actually at this uh, juncture now, and th this is also speeding up without, uh, and we are not seeing a plateau on this yet. Uh, any questions at this time? So uh, I, I think like uh, there was a, a question in the previous session about uh, uh, how do we adopt? Okay, I, I think we can answer them. Uh, Fine. Yeah, there was one question about BLSI architectures uh, to be developed for AI and ML. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, Gupta NTS, like uh, they had asked. So, like uh, when I, when I come to a GPU, like in a, in a GPU, we have uh, specialized architectures called the tensor cores. A tensor cores are nothing but uh, specialized hardware that we use for uh, uh, doing matrix multiplication. If you uh, if you have taken the uh, uh, the machine learning or uh, 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 AI courses, you, you might uh, recognize that uh, the uh, matrix uh, multiplication is a basic uh, uh, math behind all these algorithms. So the tensor core is a, a core that we designed for uh, accelerating uh, matrix multiplications, and uh, those are embedded in the uh, NVIDIA GPUs. Okay, uh, please elaborate on uh, paging and caching. When I say paging and uh, caching, like uh, the uh, okay, when, when I said talked about clusters, like uh, uh, all all these uh, for a, a typical uh, genome sequencing kind of application, the uh, chip that I showed earlier, like uh, the GH100, it's not going to be used in isolation. It's going to be used along with multiple other such cards, and all these cards are going to be uh, plugged into a, a bigger uh, pod, which we call it a pod, POD pod, uh, which we call it a DGX pod. And uh, depending on the comp uh, some companies' requirements, certain labs uh, uh, they purchase multiple such pods and interconnect them, and then like uh, that those interconnect pods are interconnected through uh, the smart NICs, and uh, it becomes a, a single big supercomputer. So when I say efficient paging and caching, uh, the uh, uh, the chips which are on a single pod they tend to uh, have a unified memory architecture. So they uh, view the entire memory or their local uh, uh, main memory in a single uh, unified way. That is called a NUMA, uh, NUMA, NUMA. And uh, how each of these uh, uh, chips are going to take the data from that uh, 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 unified uh, memory and cache them in the locally in their uh, local caches is what I uh, refer to as uh, paging and caching. There are multiple techniques. And still, uh, uh, these techniques are not matching up to some of these parallel algorithms that we are having today. So. Yeah, that, that's why I said like there are a lot of research uh, going on in this field and it's mostly a computer architecture uh, domain. Uh, that's about it. So I think, yeah, there is no more question. Okay, now uh, let us come to the second uh, aspect, uh, the cost challenges. So uh, I, I, I would probably make the statement uh, that the Moore's law is dead now. So what was the Moore's law actually? It was like, uh, I'm, I'm sure like everyone would have uh, read some uh, version of the Moore's law. But at the uh, very uh, least, it says that the number of transistors in a chip doubles every year. So this worked perfectly until 28 nanometer. So till 28 nanometer, we were using what is known as a planar MOSFET and not a FinFET. So we were using a planar MOSFET till 28 nanometer. And beyond that 28 nanometer, there were some uh, issues because of which we had to go to FinFET. I I'll cover them in the next uh, slides. So the cost per transistor, like uh, if you see the Moore's Law's corollary is that the cost per transistor also used to have every uh, two years. So the number of transistors doubled in a chip 
the cost of the chip remains same. So the cost per transistor half every two years. But if you look at this chart, the 28 nanometer was a sweet spot where the cost per transistor dipped to the uh, lower most. And since then it has started increasing. Now, if you look at uh, different literatures, you may get different opinion, but what I'm projecting here is from the uh, uh, international business strategies. This actually refers to the total cost of making a chip, like uh, 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 the co total cost of manufacturing the die per se may not exactly match this graph, but then the testing cost and then the uh, packages. So all these things have become more complicated and the overall cost of a chip uh, amortized to a, uh, a transistors, like they are uh, showing an increasing trend since uh, 28 nanometer. So that is where we need to differentiate what uh, happened there. So till 28 nanometer, as I already told, like we used what is called the bulk uh, or the planar uh, MOSFET, but the planar MOSFET ran into uh, multiple short channel methods. Let me have a slide, uh, go to this slide. So this was the planar uh, MOSFET. So we just had the uh, source and the drain and then uh, gate on, on top of it. This worked perfectly fine. But if you see uh, the area of the gate, the gate area over the channel, as a, uh, a, a size shrinks, the gate is having very, uh, the gate starts having lesser and lesser control over the channel. And because of which we start having this short channel effects. When I say short channel effects, what could it uh, cause? Like uh, there is something called the drain induced uh, barrier lowering. And because of which like this transistors uh, tend to punch through and a punch through typically damages the transistor. And uh, that's going to be an, uh, uh, take a toll on the reliability. Though initially uh, testing that uh, chip may work perfectly fine. But going ahead, like uh, within a short period of time, the chip is going to fail. That's a reliability issue. So the industry moved to what is called the fin factor. So what happened is like the, uh, the fin is raised. It's, it's raised from the substrate. This is the normal substrate. It's a raised fin. And then now the gate is designed on top of this. If you see this diagram, the gate is covering the three sides of this fin, the two sides and the top. So the entire gate width is now uh, covering all these sides, the two into the height of the fin and uh, plus the width of this fin. Uh, so for some applications or at some lower uh, technology nodes, even this single fin is not going to suffice. So we go for what is known as a gate all around technology where we create multiple fins, like each, each of them are source, they're go they going to be connected. Like each of them are source uh, fins, they're going to connect it. And these are, all, these are all drains, they will be connected. And then the gate is fabricated in such a way that it fully encircles the fin. So now if you look at this uh, slide, like what has happened here? Like we were having lesser number of masks for covering, uh, uh, for fabricating this uh, planar uh, uh, MOSFET. But within the transistor, we are creating an apartment-like structure, like Dr. Patra was saying that when you don't know how to go uh, horizontally, you grow vertically. So we are growing vertically at a transistor level, like uh, what Patra, uh, Dr. Patra said was uh, 3D stacking, 3D stacking of the chiplets. But here we are talking of the 3D stacking of the, uh, the channel area itself. So uh, each of the chiplet is going to be ha having a transistor, which is going to have a channel which is stacked in a 3D fashion. Now, this kind of uh, 3D uh, stacking entails more number of masks. When I say mask, the, the fabrication uh, mask, the photo mask, the etching mask and so on. And that increases the cost of uh, fabrication. So uh, this is the uh, cost challenge. So now this is a diagram which I think uh, uh, Dr. Patra has already discussed uh, elaborately. But I, let me just tell you uh, some more perspectives at uh, what we do at the design level. So to overcome all these uh, uh, limitations, what we do is we design the, uh, we create the entire design or we split the entire design into chiplets. We can have an uh, IO chiplet, the input output or that kind of chiplet. We can have a compute chiplet. We can have an accelerator chiplet and then put all these chiplets on this silicon interposer. And the silicon interposer is put on the packet substrate and this uh, part, the first three layers become a chip and this chip is put on the circuit board. But now the challenge for the designers, like this part, uh, uh, I think like uh, it's more of a uh, technology thing, but the challenge for the designers lies in how, what, how do we interconnect these two chiplets? When I say interconnect these two chiplets, it doesn't come for free. Like I need to uh, have a specific interface. For example, like uh, when we connect a DDR, it works seamlessly because DDR is a protocol. It, uh, it knows, uh, I mean, the, uh, the uh, processor knows how to uh, fetch the data from the memory and the uh, traces are uh, constructed accordingly and there is a uh, defined protocol. So we need to have a protocol for transfer of data from one chiplet to another chiplet. 
and that protocol needs to be very efficient. We, it should not happen that we uh, spend more number of uh, area for designing this protocol or, or for these protocol buffers. It so lands up that uh, the uh, benefits of using the chiplet goes away in the extra area incurred in designing this protocol. So NVIDIA uses this kind of a technique and uh, we have uh, what is called uh, the NVLink uh, chip C2C. The C2C stands for uh, the chip to chip. And uh, we have uh, a, a proprietary protocol called, uh, called NVLink, uh, which we use for uh, connecting these chips. So these are the challenges like uh, in this part. And I think uh, Dr. Patra briefly mentioned that there are some companies which even go to the extent of designing uh, a wafer scale uh, computer. There is a, a company called Cerebras. It's an interesting uh, read. Um, uh, uh, it's spelled as Cerebras, C-E-R-E-B-R-A-S. So they are uh, a company which have come up with an uh, uh, AI uh, chip, which is like a, where an entire wafer acts like a single chip. So that, that's an interesting read. So, uh, okay, then comes the topic of heterogeneous chiplets. Now, the, uh, as I, uh, this is the same as the previous diagram where there are multiple chiplets which are being stacked on a single interposer and the inter this entire thing becomes a package or uh, this entire thing becomes a package or a chip. And this also shows the 3D stacking. Typically, uh, uh, we use the 3D stacking as a uh, Foveros technique that uh, the Intel uses the Foveros technique. Uh, many companies have a different techniques. But what is more advantageous in this heterogeneous chiplet approach is that the IOs can be from a different technology. For example, uh, a few slides ago, we discussed that the 28 nanometer was a sweet spot with respect to uh, uh, the fabrication, like the cost. So if, for example, some of these components don't have to be at the cutting edge of the technology or some of these components don't require the latest uh, process technology, they can still be at the older 28 nanometer. And uh, the rest of them, like the compute ones, can be at the uh, recent uh, or the most latest uh, technology. And uh, all, all of these uh, different chiplets from different technologies can be uh, put on the single interposer and we can create a chip out of it. And that's something which reduces the cost of the solutions. Okay, so we covered the first, uh, sorry, we covered uh, uh, two of them, like the size and the cost. Uh, any questions at this point? Okay, uh, yeah, uh, let me just uh, uh, proceed then. So the two aspects, design considerations that we saw uh, till now are something which is not, uh, uh, the sum of the uh, solutions are in the realm of the so a technology domain also, like for example, size, like uh, uh, some of the solutions should come from the VLSA technology where uh, the fabrication uh, set up, the, fab, uh, the fabrication methodology changes. Uh, but then like there are two other aspects which I want to discuss today, which are purely in the design domain. The first one is the safety. So when we say safety, like uh, uh, the, uh, let me just uh, uh, provide two instances. I have just put the references to these uh, uh, articles in the end of the la last slide. You can have a look at it when you have the slide. So there was a very uh, peculiar case with uh, Toyota Camry. I think it was a 2005 model and uh, uh, this like this happened some, somewhere in 2007. And uh, 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 Toyota Camry met, met with an accident. And uh, there was basically, there was some onboard diagnostics which said that, okay, like the person uh, intended to uh, push the accelerator, whereas like uh, uh, the person who survived in that car crash uh, mentioned that, okay, the person didn't went to accelerate, but then uh, uh, the person applied the brakes, but then like uh, uh, the vehicle accelerated. So this investigation went on for a few years and uh, the investigating or a consulting firm which investigated this uh, failure like finally found out that uh, the toyota software was not taking care of what is known as a bit flip or uh, uh, a soft error which occurred in the chip that it was using by the way today's uh, cars they use like uh, in excess of like uh, 40 to uh, at least 40 to 50 uh, ecus or uh, electronic control units and they have like uh, millions of lines of code of uh, software written for them and uh, this particular case happened for uh, Toyota. But the thing is like uh, uh, for automotive, uh, this is fine, but we are talking about what is uh, uh, going to go in a very much more critical application like uh, biomedical applications where we can't afford to uh, uh, give such, uh, uh, where we can't have uh, afford to have such uh, room for error. So what we do for the uh, uh, soft errors. So uh, let me actually go to the next slide. 
So when we take a product cycle, we uh, talk about the reliability of the product like uh, across uh, three phases, like uh, in the first phase, or it's the, called the early uh, infant mortality failure. Like we all know that, okay, when we buy a product, we, it comes with uh, what is called the warranty. Like uh, uh, the warranty is uh, given for a few years uh, or, and then there is something called guarantee where the, uh, uh, the, the, the seller is like uh, guaranteeing that, okay, there will be no failure at all. And he can take back the product. And in the, in the case of warranty, the, uh, the seller is willing to service the product. So uh, the, uh, in early infant mortality, like uh, is when uh, we, we send the chip, when the, uh, in the case of a, a VLSI, the early uh, failures like show up more mostly in the lab, like uh, they are stress test in the lab and uh, they show up uh, mostly early in the lab. And uh, very rarely, especially in uh, uh, consumer appliances, which are not like uh, safety critical, like uh, these uh, 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 like these uh, faults tend to show up in the uh, consumer customer place, and uh, that is why uh, they are covered under what is called the guarantee. And then, like there is a relatively long period of time where the observed rate of failure is very going to be very low, or it will it's going to be flat. And uh, but during this time, the product uh, failure is going to be uh, much lesser. And then uh, over a period of time, the, as a uh, product wears out, like uh, in the case of a chip, it could be because of electron migration and many other uh, uh, reasons, like the, the power controllers uh, wear out because uh, uh, of the electron migration issues, or there are constant uh, uh, heating up because of which, like, uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, the substrate uh, starts breaking. So uh, because of multiple reasons, the wear out failures uh, start taking uh, more, uh, uh, like uh, they, they start dominating this and the failure rate increases over a period of time. Typically, the warranty lasts till uh, this point, right, where uh, uh, the manufacturer knows that, okay, there is going to be lesser number of uh, failures. In the case of, uh, if you look at this graph, like there is going to be some constant random failures, like, or uh, errors, which are going to occur during this uh, steady phase also. And uh, any manufacturer or uh, any uh, equipment maker will try to elongate this period as much as possible to give a better quality to the consumer. So this is what we are talking about. And during the uh, a long uh, uh, period, like uh, typically what we encounter is called the soft errors. Like uh, what are the kind of uh, soft errors that we encounter? So there are high energy particles or uh, cosmic rays, which are like constantly entering the earth and uh, they can uh, fall onto a chip and uh, which can toggle the uh, sing a bit, a single bit in the uh, chip. Then there are alpha particles which are coming from the packaging materials. So what happens is when a chip gets uh, heated up, the packaging material starts emitting certain alpha particles. So this is not true with all the packaging materials. So certain more expensive packaging materials emit less alpha particles. So again, this becomes a cost metric. Then there are some aspects like noise, signal integrity, and crosstalk. Uh, how much ever uh, uh, design checks that we do at the time of chip design, certain amount of these things, uh, see these traits vary across the, uh, I mean, over the period of time. And uh, these start playing, uh, uh, these start showing up as uh, soft errors. A classic example is uh, the DRAM row hammer. Like uh, it has been proved that in uh, DRAM or uh, uh, DDR memory, like if we read a certain row continuously, multiple times over and over, it has a tendency to affect the data which is stored in an adjacent row. Which is, which could be used as a targeted attack also. Like for example, you know what is stored uh, in an uh, adjacent uh, row. It could be used as a targeted, uh, it could be a mechanism for targeted attack and that attack is called the row hammer attack. So these are some of the uh, causes of bit flips and uh, bit flips are uh, catastrophic. So I once happened to, uh, that there's a very famous uh, VLSA personality in uh, Bangalore. His name is Dr. Mohan Shetty. So he used to work, uh, he used to be a scientist at uh, TI for quite some time and he founded his own company uh, called uh, Karmic, uh, stands for Karnataka Microelectronics. Uh, he's no more now. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, he was like a, a great teacher as well. Like, uh, uh, so he used to tell uh, an anecdotal evidence, like anecdotal story that uh, uh, he was down with, I think uh, he had a heart attack and he was going to be operated and he was taken to a operation theater. And uh, uh, he had, uh, he just saw the machine, which was, which he had designed during his TI days. And uh, he then uh, felt a little bit more relieved that, okay, he'd taken care of all the uh, uh, bit flips and all the reliability aspects of that uh, machine. So those are the kind of uh, catastrophic consequences that we can see if there are bit flips in uh, biomedical instruments. So these are some things that need to be taken care of. The next two parameters we are talking about is the MTTF, uh, the mean time to failure, and the MTBF, the mean time between failures. 
So uh, can anyone tell me like uh, where was where do we use this term MTBF? Like uh, in electronics, we often use this term MTBF. Uh, it's often used in uh, a particular uh, uh, in, in the context of a particular uh, design or a, a particular uh, solution. Um, can anyone just tell me where it is used? We use a technique in uh, digital electronics to improve the uh, MTBF or to uh, increase the MTBF. So anyone? Perfect, perfect. Thanks, Girish. So it's a metastability. So we say that, okay, when we have a single flop and we are having a clock domain crossover, like uh, the metastability uh, uh, can uh, uh, have a catastrophic consequence. But if you have a two-state synchronizer, what we said there is, we are not completely eliminating the effect, but what we are saying is we improve the MTPF or we increase the mean time between the failures. That's why we have option of using a three-state synchronizer, where, uh, which increases the MTPF to way beyond the lifetime of a, a human being. So uh, that is what we are talking about, like increasing the MTTF, MTBF. So these are some of the uh, design aspects that we need to consider when uh, making the safety requirements. Okay, some of the uh, hardware solutions, like when we make day-to-day uh, -day, uh, design considerations, like these are some of the hardware uh, uh, solutions that we put into the chip. Parity, like uh, we protect, uh, try, attend, try to protect all the uh, important uh, data sets with uh, parity. Like parity is a simple uh, uh, concept, like uh, check for either odd parity or even parity and add one more bit. Sometimes the parity is not uh, sufficient. We go in for what is called the error correcting course. So what is happening is like when the technology node shrinks, the distance between the two memory cells in a SRAM or a DRAM, they are going to, uh, they are further reducing that even a single particle starts affecting more than one gate. So. Uh, having a single bit error correction and double bit error detection kind of uh, error correcting codes, they help uh, more in this aspect. Then there are techniques like using the radiation hardened flops. So where uh, we say that, okay, the flop is not going to be affected by the radiation, but then this is, a, uh, uh, but this, this comes with a cost like area penalty. We also protect the instruction and data bus, like uh, the, the instruction bus and the data bus are the critical uh, digital assets on a processor. So if they are not protected, that could uh, uh, also uh, cause, uh, uh, that could also like, uh, we, we may lose fidelity because of that as well. So the instruction data buses are uh, protected. Redundancy. Redundancy is another technique that we use where we have two such designs running parallelly and make sure that uh, the, both the results of both the, uh, both the designs match. If the design, uh, if the uh, data are not matching, that means something has happened and we immediately flag an error. Software assisted checks, like a software can play an important role for uh, mitigating some of these soft errors. Like for example, uh, 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 doing a read or uh, after immediately after writing into a register can ensure that, okay, the, uh, uh, the data which got written into the register is uh, uh, sane or it's, uh, uh, it's having a, a high fidelity. And similarly, like uh, uh, repetitively reading the data once in a while in a loop, like uh, once in a while going and reading the data and uh, or the states of a, uh, st uh, or the states of a, uh, a state machine. Like uh, these are some of the things that uh, software assisted checks can help. There are several standards related to uh, safety. Uh, in fact, there are quite a, a few IoT standards like uh, which are uh, stringent, but then the more stringent standards are coming from the automotive uh, uh, domain where uh, we have this ISO 26262 uh, uh, and uh, they, they are uh, talking about the different uh, safety integrity levels. For automotive, like uh, these uh, uh, safety integrity levels are defined as ASIL, uh, A, B, C, D. And similarly, like uh, there are SIL, A, B, C, D for other uh, equipments. Uh, this is again another uh, field of research and uh, uh, more than research, there, there needs to be some uh, organized study and standardization effort required for uh, biomedical uh, uh, applications. So for biomedical applications today, uh, we just generally tag them with uh, IoT applications. We don't have a specific uh, uh, biomedical standard uh, for uh, safety. So this is something that can be, uh, th that is an area of uh, interest that where, which needs to be worked upon. Okay, uh, next comes the security. So I, I think like uh, uh, some speakers, like uh, uh, at least two of them, I remember like uh, uh, Professor Patnayak also was telling that, okay, how do I trust? Like, I think he used the word trust. How do I uh, trust that uh, uh, the transaction is coming from uh, a particular, uh, the, the correct uh, person? So there were uh, quite a few uh, instances, which I've just quoted in this uh, slide. 
the most interesting of them i find is this uh, jeep uh, jeep cherokee uh, jeep cherokee is jeep is actually the uh, fiat chrysler uh, company uh, which manufactures this uh, cherokee suv so this uh, particular vehicle got uh, hacked and uh, remotely like uh, the hacker uh, remotely hacked into this uh, vehicle through its uh, electronic uh, just a moment there is some power sa power saving uh, algorithm in this room also okay so uh, yeah the hackers uh, remotely uh, uh, hacked this uh, jeep uh, or or this uh, uh, vehicle uh, using its uh, entertainment uh, systems like uh, entertainment system has is uh, all this wifi uh, and all this uh, uh, lte kind of connectivity and the hackers found their way into it they hacked the device they made it stop they they uh, they were actually doing like more like a ethical hacking because hacking is illegal so they just wanted to prove the point that okay a vehicle can be hacked so uh, they hacked this device they made the engine stop and then they started the engine all without the control of the driver so this is a kind of uh, uh, security threat i mean this is a kind of era where we are at a security threat almost at every uh, stage so related to biomedical there are uh, multiple uh, uh, cases where like uh, there have been cyber security hacks into uh, uh, patient monitoring systems to falsify the vital signs just imagine like uh, this is like a bond movie where uh, somebody kills someone like a big shot or someone like uh, they just show that the person had a, a cardiac arrest and their own people kill the person so these are some of the cyber security risks that we are at uh, in today so what are the major uh, uh, ways in which like, i mean, i've just listed down the very uh, the top few uh, of course there are multiple uh, ways in which uh, 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 security can be compromised i've just uh, listed down the uh, top few top few first is a wiretap like uh, someone has a physical access to the de device and uh, 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 they use a uh, uh, like a compromised device and then uh, wiretap that wiretap is typically used when you say wiretap wiretap is typically used for snooping the information like are taking the confidential information of a patient uh, out or, or something then we have what is called the man in the middle attack like uh, uh, someone uh, uh, like can tap the wire like uh, they uh, they are tapping the data and then they retransmit something uh, falsified information for example a report says that okay a person is having some xyz problem but then uh, uh, somebody in the middle taps the data and then retransmits saying that okay the problem uh, the problem is not uh, the problem is x1 by 1 z1 and not xyz so that's like a, a kind of a, another kind of an attack the third kind of attack is a denial of service attack uh, a classic example of this denial of service happened uh, some time ago in uh, uh, germany uh, i think like uh, uh, a group uh, hacked into the network of uh, german hospital they hacked all the devices they made sure that none of the devices were in a usable state and they even demanded a ransom in bitcoins so this is a kind of uh, a damage that a denial of service attack can cause and i think uh, uh, in this case like it was coming through a malware like a malware uh, injected through a uh, uh, injected into the uh, hospital's uh, uh, network that that uh, uh, gave the access uh, to the uh, that, that gave the access to the hackers and the hackers were able to hold all the people at ransom and the hospital was not able to take uh, any new patients and they had to shift the existing patients to a different hospital one of the patients died there was a big lawsuit so all these uh, th things are they, they are uh, real and uh, present danger so when we say threats they can be sometimes they can be physical and sometimes they can be remote as i said like when you have we can remotely hack a uh, 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 vehicle similarly uh, remotely we can hack into a, a network and uh, uh, th this can be uh, a threat can be uh, embedded so what are some of the uh, hardware security solutions uh, uh, that we need to uh, take care so the three uh, uh, aspects the confidentiality integrity and availability are the bedrock of uh, security when i say confidentiality the data needs to be encrypted like uh, when we send uh, data especially uh, uh, the personal data see sometimes like uh, we are not just talking about uh, 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 like uh, we we think that okay uh, a patient's uh, illness record like it doesn't have much value but then often times like uh, in biomedical uh, systems the uh, illness record is also stored along with the patient's financial data and other information and sometimes even illness record is uh, confidential it's not supposed to be made public so uh, uh, what we need to have, have is like a, a strong encryption algorithm like a weaker encryption algorithm is again going to be compromised like we need to have a strong encryption algorithm so here again uh, this is a, again a, a good topic of research but it's slightly more uh, uh, far away from uh, uh, the biomedical applications but it's a generic area of research uh, 
how to improve like uh, uh, i mean most of the uh, uh, like uh, uh, encryption algorithms are like uh, supposed supposed to be np hard but with the more advances in computing some of the algorithms are already being compromised so we are going to much more stringent algorithms but they are coming up with power and uh, area uh, overheads so how to uh, come up with more better encryption algorithms symmetric keys asymmetric keys uh, hashes so how to uh, come up with those algorithms is one area of research the next aspect is very critical the integrity so how do i even this is actually the word which this actually goes with that word trust like which dr uh, uh, professor patnaik mentioned so first we should, we need to have uh, access control like first of all uh, have proper access control to our systems so that uh, uh, a person with not uh, with uh, or a person or an entity which doesn't have the proper access controls is not even able to access the data uh, present in our uh, uh, setup the second one is authentication so uh, uh, dr patra briefly touched upon the subject called cloud so in the cloud what happens is like we have arrays of uh, uh, ma massive arrays of uh, processors and uh, accelerators and uh, so on so what if a person like who has a physical access to that uh, uh, cloud or the the data center embeds a device which can transmit all the data of a particular uh, uh, which can uh, of a particular uh, company or a particular uh, per, uh, hospital or so on so we need to have authentication to make sure that uh, a particular device has a good firmware like uh, there is a lot of emphasis on what is called the secured boot so uh, this probably will fall into the domain of uh, computer science today but then like this needs to be uh, worked with uh, vlsi design so the design uh, has to ensure that okay only a secured boot uh, happens in a device and an uh, during an unsecured boot like the device just shuts off and similarly like when uh, somebody is like uh, 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 connecting a new device that new device authenticates itself like uh, make by make uh, telling that okay this is the firmware and this is the company that signed the firmware by using uh, authentication keys and second and uh, lastly the authorization when authorization is like someone authorizing a person to access a, a particular this is more uh, in line with the access control like authorization is uh, uh, a part where like uh, we have embedded uh, keys where uh, only certain uh, accesses are authorized and certain other accesses are not authorized the third important critical aspect of uh, security uh, i mean the uh, collaterals of uh, security is the availability so we have to make sure that all the equipments that we are uh, designing like uh, they are available all the time like uh, it cannot happen that okay there is a denial of service attack and uh, certainly at certain times the equipment is not available or for example we cannot say that okay uh, if there is a hack i am going to shut down a uh, uh, certain heart lung machine in a hospital and that uh, reboot is going to take 2 uh, 3 hours or, or uh, 2 3 minutes also because like uh, that availability should always be there like uh, shutting down and rebooting so these are not some of the uh, 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 solutions that are uh, provide, uh, possible there so we need to make sure that this uh, device is always available and uh, for that like we need to make sure that okay like the even the um, risk mitigation processes some of the risk mitigation processes that we take for example we find that there is an attack the risk mitigation doesn't mean that uh, we uh, shut down the system automatically like uh, the the system should uh, st uh, some parts of the system should still be available for for the uh, use of the uh, consumer so to handle all these things there is a, a great bit of uh, research which is going into what is called the root of trust and the chain of trust so uh, if you folks have uh, a windows laptop and uh, if you recently noticed that the windows 11 update uh, required what is called uh, the tpm like uh, the trusted platform module so only those laptops which are uh, having this tpm module uh, uh, were uh, able to get the windows 11 update so this tpm is nothing but a chip it's a microcontroller like uh, it's a real time uh, processor uh, and it's a micro a real time processor and uh, it has and it stores all the critical uh, cryptographic assets of the uh, uh, system for example all the keys that are need to be exchanged and all the uh, signs like uh, for example like uh, different companies have uh, different digital signatures so all these digital signatures they are all uh, stored there and they are uh, and this uh, tpm is a trusted module which is not hackable like uh, uh, the uh, and this is forming what is called the root of trust and this tpm subsequently authenticates each of the device and uh, there are multiple uh, these days like device come also come with uh, uh, some certain microcontrollers within the uh, accelerators accelerators process all of have a, a separate uh, safety mic or security microcontroller 
and uh, these microcontrollers are in turn authenticated by the root of trust and then that builds the entire chain of trust so this is another uh, topic of interest and where uh, large amount of research is going on how to build the chain of trust in different kind of applications like uh, a cloud could be one where it's entirely a compute kind of application whereas like in a, a hospital scenario like we add multiple uh, different devices uh, to our uh, main uh, to our central controlling the computer but are, are all the devices like uh, coming up with uh, uh, are all the devices having a secure software like even if one of the devices is not having a secure software that is going to be the like uh, trojan and uh, uh, that, that's going to break the uh, the security of the entire uh, uh, organization so this chain of trust is more critical and how to build it for different setup is another area of interest there are multiple uh, uh, standards and regulations when i say standards like standards are like a prescribed uh, way of doing certain things but then the standard is not enforced for example i could have uh, a standard for uh, uh, video coding, but uh, uh, I need not follow that and I can have my own uh, way of doing it. I can slightly deviate from the standard, but then there comes the regulation where uh, some body, which is uh, much higher up comes up, comes out and says that, okay, no, uh, these regulations uh, have to be followed. And the regulations also uh, uh, call out like, what are the standards which are uh, coming under that uh, regulation? So what we see is like in the case of automotive, uh, there has been a lead which is taken, like uh, uh, we have a, a cyber security a standard for automotive called 21434. And there is a regulation uh, which is called the UNEC, where UN stands for the United Nations, UNEC, R155 and R156. These uh, mandate the participating countries to have cars which are adhering to this uh, ISO 21434 standard. This kind of uh, uh, standard is not fully widely accepted in uh, biomedical applications. This is another area of research that uh, people can focus. So uh, these are the things which I had uh, for uh, today. So uh, let me see if, I, if there are any questions before I uh, move on to the next few slides. Okay, uh, used in where? Sorry. Uh, difference between stability and reliability. Okay, uh, stability is, uh, uh, we typically don't use the word uh, stability in uh, uh, VLSI designs. It's more about uh, uh, the, the, the system design. Like reliability is like when we give a certain input or when given an input, the transfer function of that uh, device always produces the same output. So that is reliability. Like uh, uh, it should not happen that because of software error or uh, any other errors or any fault which is happening in uh, inside the chip, or it could be a physical fault or it could be a temporary fault. It should not happen that the uh, a device produces a different result uh, any one of the time. So reliability is like producing the same result time after time. Stability is more uh, of a stochastic uh, term. Like, okay, like I have like thousand trials. But the, the, oh, by the way, that is not something that we uh, work on in VLSI per, per se. Like for example, stability, I would say that, okay, when we have say thousand trials, and then like uh, uh, out of that 1000 trials, 990 trials, like it produces the correct result, 10 trials, like it's not producing the correct result. But then we say that the, the system is stable or quasi stable, but uh, that, that's more like a probabilistic uh, domain, whereas uh, reliability is like making sure that the answer is correct every time. Uh, okay. Sir, uh, one Sorry. more question, sir. Uh, difference between FinFET and uh, ferroelectric FET. Okay, uh, okay. I, I'm not uh, the thing about ferroelectric uh, FET, but uh, uh, the FinFET is like more of a, uh, okay, the, the answer is like, I don't know about the ferroelectric uh, FET part. Uh, the FinFET is like uh, more of, uh, uh, an, uh, I mean, the next generation of a MOSFET, the planar MOSFET. Uh, sorry, I don't know about the ferroelectric part, uh, ferroelectric FET part. Sir, uh, working difference between uh, MOSFET and uh, quantum dot cellular automata, QCA cells. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, like, uh, fine. Uh, quantum is a totally different paradigm altogether. Like uh, in binary, uh, we talk about uh, 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 like uh, two states, like zero and one, and quantum is a totally different paradigm. And that is again, something which I have not worked on. Like, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I would not be able to answer that question. Sorry. So that's all, sir, in the... Yeah, I, I just see one more uh, thing, like in your opinion, what is the best source to follow that recent developments in the LSA industry? Can you name a few sources so we can get? Uh, okay, I, I'll come to that. Like uh, uh, there are certain uh, conferences, like uh, uh, I've listed down certain resources uh, here as well. Like some of them are the articles which I referred for uh, uh, this, like uh, this uh, slides. 
Nvidia has this uh, conference called uh, GTC. Like uh, uh, GTC is a conference. Now we are going to have this GTC uh, later this month, 19th uh, to 22nd. And this is a very good uh, source of information for uh, uh, generally about AI and uh, Nvidia products. So uh, I'm sure like uh, if you can register for this conference, it will be uh, very valuable and probably you can ask the students also to uh, register here. Uh, uh, like uh, th this should be a valuable uh, source. Besides that, like NVIDIA has this student program, uh, university program uh, where uh, NVIDIA uh, takes part, like uh, can create the uh, AI lab uh, in uh, uh, the universities and uh, the universities, the, the researchers, uh, the, the academia and the uh, company can collaborate. Uh, by the way, NVIDIA has uh, investments in a lot of startups also, like uh, AI and uh, ML startups. Like uh, So th through a program called a uh, NVIDIA Inception program, there is something called the NVIDIA Deep Learning Institute, where uh, there are a lot of trainings about uh, deep learning. Uh, so this is something that uh, the faculty and students can uh, 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 get the benefit of. And uh, if you're already using, uh, uh, or, uh, using uh, AI and ML techniques, then there is a, something called the Developer Program, where it uh, gives the entire uh, software uh, suite and, uh, uh, that can be downloaded and even uh, uh, we can rent uh, uh, certain uh, uh, clouds uh, i mean uh, the the gpu workloads can be rented on the amazon or any other uh, public cloud and uh, these uh, uh, programs can be implemented in the cloud itself you, you don't have to purchase the hardware uh, per se so these programs enable like uh, students to uh, uh, implement their designs in a fraction of a cost actually and uh, the university program actually it's a collaboration of the of the company with uh, universities uh, the academia and the researchers. So uh, I'm sure like uh, we can make use of this to the uh, utmost uh, extent. Okay, is any postdoc uh, postdoc pro program in VLSI biomedical in NVIDIA? Uh, uh, sure, you can uh, we can connect and uh, I can explore like uh, uh, the, uh, NVIDIA has uh, a, a group called NVIDIA Research. Like uh, some of the topics that uh, uh, Dr. Patra mentioned, like we also uh, using that in our company and that is a product of NVIDIA research. So uh, I, I can explore that and I can help you uh, 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 connect to the right people there. Uh, how are we on the time? I think we are already short of time. Okay, uh, that, that's all I had uh, for today. Uh, any more questions? No, sir, no, that's sir. all. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all uh, for the patience. Uh, I hope it was useful. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity once again. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank respected you. sir, on behalf of Bangladesh of Technology and ECE Research Center, I extend vote of thanks to our esteemed speaker, Satnayan Balaji, who spared time from his busiest schedule to grace the occasion. Today, we had an opportunity to hear your thoughts, and this will surely be going to encourage us in our future events. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, dear participants, uh, uh, afternoon session is hands on session uh, using py, uh, Python. So, please, all of you be ready with your laptops. So, afternoon session will start at 2 o'clock. Thank you very thank much, you much, sir. Uh, thank you, madam. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.